Recording in progress. Okay, great. So we have started the recording here. Um, we'll go ahead and kick off the meeting. Thank you, Matthew, for getting that started for us. Um, Brandon, if you're ready and you would like to go to the next slide, um, I can start our introductions. Great, thank you so much. Um, so again, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining uh, the public workshop to discuss the proposed statewide NPDES construction stormwater permit reissuance. Uh, we're all very glad you're here today. I know it's been a long process for all of us. Um, we do appreciate your participation. While many people we realize are concurrently dealing with the impacts on our communities due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as turmoil abroad. Um, I'm Amy Cronson. I'm the unit senior of the Industrial and Construction Stormwater Permitting Unit here at the State Water Resources Control Board and the Industrial and Construction Stormwater uh, Program Manager for the State Water Board. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Brandon. So we have a great team uh, working here with us today, as well as um, have been working on this permit reissuance, some for many years and some for a shorter time. So um, as we begin this public workshop, I'd like to introduce our program staff. We have Brandon Rosenboom, uh, who will be presenting information on staff's response to comments. He's also the lead permit writer for the construction stormwater general permit. Um, as well as the lead staff for construction stormwater at the State Board. Uh, following the staff presentation, Brandon, uh, Cape, Cape Silverheim, and myself will be available to answer any questions that you may have. And then behind the scenes, we have Matthew Shimizu. Hi, Matthew. He's working on technical support end and managing Zoom, but he's an environmental scientist in the unit and has been a great technical help on this permit reissuance as well. Salvador Chaparro, I'm sorry, Sal. Salvador Chaparro is a water resource control engineer. He's monitoring for questions in the Zoom as well as from email. Um, and then Reed Hoshovsky, another environmental scientist in our unit. Um, great technical work on data analysis, data visualization. And he's taking notes and providing support for us today. Um, all of these folks and more have been working diligently on writing the permit doing necessary technical research, managing and visualizing data, and responding to public comments. So um, a thank you to all of my staff and the folks uh, behind the scenes. Next slide. Thanks, Brandon. Um, so the State Water Board's mission is to preserve, enhance, and restore California's water resources for the benefit of present and future generations, which is why we want to begin this meeting by acknowledging groups who have and, can, and who continue to experience economic, environmental, and social disadvantages as a result of historic mar marginalization and whose daily lives are impacted by racism and injustices. Um, as a reminder, our work here today should be to uh, strengthen and empower community voices as we celebrate or as we collaborate to provide clean, safe, and affordable water to all Californians. So the uh, purpose of today's workshop is a uh, few things. One is to explain the continuing public process um, per the notice that was re released on March. 30th of 2022, which is the notice that brought you here today, um, and to provide a high-level overview of the proposed permit content, to identify specific items that changed in response to comments, and those that are subject to a limited scope public comment period. And so the changes in response to comment would be in response to comments that we received over the summer. They were due August 13th of 2021. Um, and then we're also here to answer questions and provide clarification uh, to assist interested parties in understanding the permit requirements. Um, the draft permit documents can be found on our program's webpage. Um, and there, there also a note, there also might be one or two state water board members in attendance today um, viewing this workshop, but no action will be taken. And this is not a board hearing. Uh, next slide. So some workshop logistics. Um, it's a little different from when we prepared this slide, but it is being recorded and we will post it on the web um, as soon as we can. 
Uh, and then if you're able to participate via the Zoom, it looks like we have about 170 participants so far. Um, hopefully we'll get more as that email gets out to folks um, and they can access the Zoom. Um, so the staff presentation provides information for stakeholders and interested parties to understand the proposed permit for a few specific things. One, uh, feedback to the State Water Board at next week's uh, State Water Board uh, Board Workshop, April 19th, um, and to inform and provide feedback for written comments on the limited scope public comment period that was noticed uh, with this workshop on March 30th. And then also um, to help folks develop their oral comments at the uh, July 19th, 2022 State Water Board meeting for consideration of permit adoption. And just to clarify, there are no um, oral or written comments being taken today. Um, this is just a workshop for uh, information and feedback. Um, and then also just to answer questions. And so all questions will be answered to the best of staff's ability and my ability. Um, and then again, this presentation will be posted uh, just the slides as well as the recorded video on our program's webpage. Um, also, you can subscribe to our LIRAS if you would like uh, further updates. And I think most of you are already su subscribed since you got notice of this meeting. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just some Zoom meeting participation instructions. Um, I think we'll have a lot more folks on the Zoom since the broadcast isn't working. Um, we do encourage our workshop participants to take advantage of the Zoom meeting chat function, um, as well to enter questions and feedback throughout the presentation. We have staff monitoring that chat function. Um, at the end of the presentation, staff will respond to questions in the order they're received. And if you would like to present your question and feedback yourself, um, please let us know and the staff will allow you to unmute. All right, and then the schedule for the workshop is uh, we hoped to start at nine, so we'll try to move a little bit quickly um, and then we'll present until about 10, uh, answer some, quest some questions and then take a 10 minute intermission before we come back for more question and answer. Next slide. All right, and with that, I will hand it over to Brandon Rosenboom, uh, Water Resource Control Engineer and Construction Stormwater Lead Staff. So go ahead, Brandon. Thank you for the introduction, Amy. <clears throat> All right, we'll begin this presentation with um, some uh, context on the construction stormwater permitting process. So the Federal Clean Water Act prohibits certain discharges of stormwater to waters of the United States except those that comply with a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit, otherwise known as MPDES. The Construction of Stormwater General Permit is a specific MPDES permit that regulates discharges of runoff generated by precipitation over a construction site and other areas of land disturbance. The State Water Bo uh, Research Control Board adopted the existing MPDES Construction of Stormwater General Permit in 2009 to regulate stormwater discharges associated with these construction activities, disturbing one or more acres of land. The 2009 Construction Stormwater General Permit expired in September of 2014 and has been administratively extended until the effective date of a reissued Construction Stormwater General Permit. The proposed permit serves to implement regulatory requirements such as federal effluent limitation guidelines, statewide policies, and total maximum daily loads that became effective since the adoption of the 2009 permit. So what are the primary differences between the proposed permit and the 2009 existing permit? Well, um, there's been an addition of the total maximum daily load implementation requirements, addition of passive treatment technology requirements, addition of the notice of non-applicability criteria, um, revised notice of termination process, updated implementation and statewide water quality control plans, and then new requirements for discharges um, from dewatering activities associated with construction. Continuing on, um, there are additional requirements for demolition activities, uh, the implementation of a new federal sufficiently sensitive test methods rule, revised, uh, revised monitoring and reporting requirements, 
and then the removal of both the bioassessment monitoring requirements and the uranium event action plan requirements. All right. So as many of you know, the permit reissuance process can take um, several years. This timeline depicts the proposed permit reissuance process to date. Um, over the course of several years, State Water Board staff engaged in preliminary stakeholder outreach to discuss proposals for regulatory requirements to implement existing regulations. A preliminary draft was released in November of 2020 um, and furthered, adi uh, furthered additional discussions with interested parties that resulted in um, the May 2021 draft that was released for public comment. The State Water Board hosted a public hearing on August 4th, 2021 for interested parties and the regulated community to voice their feedback um, as part of a 75-day public comment period that ended on August 13th, 2021. Since then, staff have been working to catalog and respond to nearly 1,200 comments um, that we received. During this time, staff met with, um, continued to meet with in, in, uh, interested parties to discuss further changes to the proposed requirements that were addressing their concerns. Once those requirements were drafted, the State Water Board issued a public notice to post the revised permit documents. Along with the release of the latest draft permit documents, the March 30th, 2022 public notice included um, the response to comments received on the May 2021 draft. The public notice also initiated a limited scope public comment period for four items that we will be discussing later on in this presentation. The State Water Board staff will only be accepting written comment letters during this um, public comment period. On April 19th, 2022, the State Water Board will be hosting a workshop for staff to explain proposed changes um, and for stakeholders and interested parties to provide feedback on the latest draft. The limited scope public comment period will end on May 2nd, 2022. Staff will respond to the written comment letters and prepare a final draft in response to comments 30 days prior to the July 19th um, board meeting to consider adoption of the permit. Staff have proposed an effective date of July 1st, 2023, which is roughly one year after the tentative adoption date. All right. Moving on, um, the next section will be the bulk of today's workshop. I will be sharing a summary of the changes that staff um, made to the construction stormwater general permit in response to the comments received on the May 2021 draft. Um, as mentioned earlier, staff received nearly 1,200 comments on the May 2021 draft of the permit. Uh, staff organized the comments into categories, which are listed on the slide here. Um, and these will be the primary focus of today's workshop. So the workshop will be proceeding um, through these categories in order. I'll give you a few seconds to kind of move through these. All right. The first category of implementation requirements um, is, or is implementation requirements for active treatment systems. So active treatment systems, such as the one pictured to the left, use chemical coagulation, chemical flocculation, and or electrical, electrical coagulation to aid in the reduction of turbidity caused by fine suspended sediments. Um, active treatment systems are uh, enclosed computerized systems, which are comprised of tanks, um, pumps, filters, and real-time controls. Uh, Staff removed the minimum design storm criteria, or so we're going into some of the proposed changes. Um, staff removed the minimum design storm criteria, which was previously the 10 year, 24 hour storm, to provide dischargers with flexibility in what size systems they can use to treat captured stormwater. Staff had heard that the 10 year, 24 hour storm was too large and um, made this beneficial technology cost prohibitive for many dischargers. Staff added a provision that allows the discharger to also bypass an active treatment system if all the discharges from the watershed area that the ATS was designed to treat are already in compliance with the discharge prohibitions, numeric action levels, and numeric effluent limitations, um, and receiving water limitations that were established in the permit. 
The discharger would demonstrate this through applicable monitoring requirements um, in attachment D or E. So those would be your standard stormwater sampling requirements. Staff also revised the active treatment system plan submission requirements so that the active treatment system plan um, must be submitted at least 14 days prior to operation of an active treatment system. The 2009 permit only allowed dischargers to submit um, active treatment plans via a change of information in SMARTS. Um, now they may be submitted along with the notice of intent app application if the discharger knows that they will be implementing a system at the forefront of their project. Lastly, staff decided to remove um, designer and training requirements as it is in the discharger's best interest to hire professionals that are experienced in the design and operation of active treatment systems and the permit need not enforce on um, specific certifications for those. Next, we're going to delve into some of the more administrative changes um, that staff made in response to comment. So the first would be simplifying the proposed permit attachments as shown on the screen. Staff attempted to address comments received about the length of the permit by restructuring the permit itself. Um, we turned all the appendices into attachments, consolidated the previous three risk level attachments um, into a single attachment for traditional construction requirements, and then revised the order of the attachments to improve flow. Um, so now there's <clears throat> an attachment D, D.1, and D.2 for um, the risk level requirements, the risk determination worksheet, and then permit registration documents. And that is similarly mirrored for the linear underground and overhead projects. Most of the requirements are generally now listed in one section of the permit. If the requirements were found in multiple locations throughout the permit, staff um, made these requirements consistent as a permit. As mentioned earlier, staff is proposing an effective date of July 1st, 2023 for the construction storm auto general permit reissuance. This date was um, selected to allow ample time for the state water board staff to enhance our reporting system smarts and to accommodate um, electro or to accommodate electronic submittals and provide the regulated community and stormwater professionals with roughly a year to prepare for the new permitting requirements. Um, that is if the current uh, anticipated reissuance timeline upholds. Additionally, the regulated community requested that the effective date be set sometime during the drier period of our year, and that typically um, is the summer. Hey, Brandon, sorry to interrupt real yeah. quick. Um, can you maybe move your mic a little bit? Folks are having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Oh, sure. Replug it. <laughs> Does that sound better? I can also speak a little louder. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thanks. All right. Um, so, and this is one of the, uh, this is the first of the four items that are included in the limited scope public comment period. Um, any of the slides that you see with this little yellow text in the bottom left hand corner um, will indicate when the slide is discussing a limited scope public item. So staff received many comments regarding how the numerous changes to permitting requirements will impact projects that have already been planned and are operating under an established budget. Thus, staff included a regulatory transition period for dischargers with active enrollment in the 2009 permit. Or in other words, they have an active waste discharge identification number already uh, established from SMARTS. These dischargers may continue their coverage under the 2009 permit for up to three years after the effective date of the reissued permit. So three years after the effective date of the reissued permit, all notices of intent um, for regulatory coverage under the 2009 permit will be administratively terminated. Any project that has not been completed um, will need to obtain coverage under the reissued permit to continue their construction activities. Staff determines that three years was an appropriate um, transition period based on the average um, and median project durations recorded in SMARTS. This provision should allow dischargers to adhere to their contractual obligations while ensuring that all new or stagnating notices of intent obtain regular, regulatory coverage under the reissued construction stormwater general permit. Um, we provided an ample regulatory transition period based, oh, I already said. 
um, they, or on the average median duration between the notice of intent and the notice of termination. Um, this is another administrative change that we think will um, assist with some of the administrative uh, or it, to provide uh, increased efficiency for uh, developers who may want to be reducing um, the acreage that is covered under the construction for a moderate general permit. Staff incorporated a new provision for dischargers to terminate residential lots that have unfinished yards and landscaping areas. In order to reduce acreage, the discharger must meet the following criteria. The residential lot has been sold to an individual homeowner um, for residential use and um, a certificate of occupancy or equivalent document is maintained on site. The lot must be less than one acre of disturbance. All construction activity conducted on the lot by the discharger is complete and the discharger has installed temporary, BM, uh, temporary best management practices to stabilize the unfinished yards and landscaping areas. The discharger shall upload as an attachment to SMARTS documentation of a contract, such as covenants, conditions, and restrictions, or CCNRs, um, requiring individual homeowners to stabilize the yard and landscaping within one year um, to, and to maintain their temporary best management practices until they have um, put in their, their landscaping and stabilization, stabilization is met. One of the most common comments staff receive is that proposed draft permit or that the proposed draft permit will result in a dramatic increase in the cost of compliance. Um, some estimates that we received indicated an increase of up to 40% uh, for compliance due to increased workload, um, additional qualified SWIFT developer and qualified SWIFT practitioner responsibilities, um, and then the inclusion of total mass and daily load sampling, numeric effort limitations, and um, laboratory analyses. Staff recognizes that there is high variability in the cost of compliance across con all construction projects um, and that most of the purported cost increases are connected to new permit provisions such as total maximum daily load implementation and passive treatment requirements. Uh, staff wants to clarify that the construction from our general permit uh, total maximum daily load implementation requirements only apply to um, specific watersheds and to specific dischargers that have pollutants on their site. Um, that includes the numeric effluent limitations, um, which those are in themselves are only triggered when non-visible pollutant monitoring um, is triggered on site. The uh, staff also wants to emphasize that any increased expenses associated with this permit are balanced with benefits to uh, the protection of water quality and um, aquatic life uh, due to the implementation of those requirements. So cost considerations um, were detailed in the fact sheet um, sections IF and IG. That said, I did want to spend a moment highlighting where staff anticipate there to be increases and decreases in the cost of compliance due to changes in the proposed requirements. So staff expect TMDL implementation, passive treatment, and dewatering requirements to increase the cost of compliance for dischargers to which those requirements apply. Meaning we do not expect every discharger to experience an increase in the cost of compliance as not every discharger will be responsible for complying with TMDLs and not every discharger uses passive treatment or dewaters in areas that don't have separate dewatering permits. Staff does, however, expect every discharger to experience an increase in the cost of compliance associated with hiring qualified SWIFT developers and qualified SWIFT practitioners to perform some of their mandatory responsibilities, such as inspectors. However, these costs are partially offset by the removal of rain event action plans um, and are intended to improve compliance with the permit requirements. Staff anticipate a decrease in costs for some dischargers that are eligible for the notice of non applicability in which they will actually not need to enroll under the permit. We are also seeking to improve permitting administrative efficiency through the notice of termination process, uh, programmatic permitting for linear projects, and allowing developers to sell off individual residential lots with unfinished yards um, that are temporarily stabilized. 
Other decreases in costs of compliance include the removal of rain event action plans and bioassessment monitoring requirements for risk level three sites. Okay. Next, we'll be discussing proposed changes to dewatering requirements, but let's start with a description of what dewatering is. Dewatering is the process of removing excess water um, via pumping, siphoning, or other mechanical means. Dewatering is commonly used to remove non portable water that collects in excavations, impoundments, and other accumulation points on construction sites. Occasionally, construction activities result in excavations deep enough to reach the water table, which results in groundwater filling the workspace. A proposed permit would, will authorize dewatering of this groundwater specifically related to construction activities. However, groundwater removal not related to construction activities needs to be um, covered under a separate uh, national pollutant discharge elimination system permit issued by the regional water board. Thus, attachment J only applies to dischargers that are not subject to separate dewatering permits, such as um, the aforementioned MPDS permit um, or de minimis permits and low threat discharge permits, which are also issued by the regional water board. It is the discharger's responsibility to confirm whether their dewatering activities are already regulated by a permit other than the construction stormwater general permit. Staff clarified that a discharger who is subject to separate coverage for dewatering is not subject to dewatering requirements in attachment J. The discharger will need to state that they are subject to separate coverage for dewatering discharges in their SWIFT. Staff also clarified that any changes made to the SWIP because of dewatering activities um, should be uploaded into SMART via a change of information, um, which would go through regional water board approval. Staff clarified that if pH or uh, turbidity numeric action levels are exceeded um, during the dewatering discharges, uh, dewatering discharges must cease, and um, it's not operations at the construction site must cease. I think there was a a discrepancy in interpretation in the May 2021 draft. So operations may continue, um, just not the dewatering discharges themselves. Um, there is a few changes to the glossary definition. So staff added definitions for ancillary areas, groundwater, property boundary, property or project area, and site, as well as clarified others. That was a nice quick slide. And then there were also some revisions to the inactive sites requirements. So staff revised order section 3G2C to consider more hazardous conditions in which access to a site becomes infeasible. In this case, snow on the ground makes it difficult to inspect an inactive site. In addition, snowy road conditions and generally freezing temperatures add to the hazards. Um, Staff also clarified that photos of temporary stabilization um, best management practices are required to be included in the change of information um, where the SWIP is updated. All right, moving on, we'll be discussing some of the changes to the linear underground overhead projects. So programmatic permitting um, is a, something that we introduced or reintroduced in the May 2021 draft but it was limited to um, risk level one, uh, or sorry, LEP type one projects. Uh, so programmatic permitting allows linear underground and overhead projects dischargers to sub, uh, submit a single notice of intent to obtain coverage for multiple non-contiguous linear underground overhead projects if they are located within a single regional water board. Consists of similar scopes, and activities, and then also have the uh, same legally responsible person. Uh, staff are now proposing to extend pro programmatic permitting to all LEP types, which is expected to reduce the administrative inefficiencies for um, primarily utility companies. Staff clarified how um, linear utility or linear underground and overhead project segments can be defined, including logical delineators such as. Um, different contractors working on a segment, uh, phasing of the projects, topography, 
watershed and jurisdictional boundaries. So say if the segment goes through um, areas that are, are regulated by a city versus regulated by a county, they can delineate those as segments if they so choose. Staff reinserted language um, so that LEP discharges are not required to comply with post-construction requirements in the proposed permit. Uh, the exemption from post-construction requirements is consistent with the 2009 permit and was accidentally omitted from the May 2021 draft during um, the reorganization, reorganization of that draft. Moving forward, we'll be discussing changes to um, the monitoring requirements and specifically focusing on inspection requirements. So staff made four general changes to inspection requirements for stormwater monitoring. Staff originally proposed the removal of the weekly inspection requirement for risk level one sites. However, weekly inspections um, for all sites were reinstated as they serve as the baseline for maintaining compliance um, at a construction project. The amount of precipitation forecasted to occur rather than the amount accumulated um, will be the basis for all stormwater related inspections. This will allow improved planning for inspections and decrease the number of inspections missed due to daylight constraints. Um, based on improved midterm forecasts by the National Weather Service, staff revised the permit um, to allow pre-qualifying precipitation inspections three to five days in advance of the event, providing an additional 48 hours for inspection compared to the existing permit. Lastly, staff removed the requirement for photo documentation of missed inspections and will only require a narrative explanation uh, to be uh, documented. There are also some changes to the definition of a qualifying precipitation event. So a qualifying precipitation event was redefined so that it, it is initiated by a forecasted event of half an inch or more precipitation within a 24 hour period. The qualifying precipitation event continues for subsequent 24 hour periods with um, a quarter inch or more of forecasted precipitation and ends when there are two consecutive 24 hour periods with less than um, a quarter inch forecasted. The post qualifying precipitation event inspection may be performed on uh, either day with less than a quarter inch predicted and inspections are not required for any 24 hour period within the events with less than um, a quarter of the uh, So this graphic sort of summarizes the qualifying precipitation event inspection process. When the National Weather Service predicts an upcoming 24 hour period of a half an inch or more precipitation, the inspector must complete a pre-qualifying precipitation event inspection anytime um, from three to five days prior to the onset. Once the storm begins, an inspection is required during work, working hours or more operating hours within the initial 24 hour period of precipitation. If the forecast was revised to less than half an inch before the event begins, an inspection must still be done if um, a quarter inch is still forecasted or a quarter inch or more is still forecasted. During qualifying precipitation events, inspections are required for each subsequent 24 hour period where a quarter inch is forecast, but not required during um, the 24 hour intervals if less than a quarter inch is predicted. The qualifying precipitation event ends when there are two consecutive 24 hour periods where less than a quarter inch is forecast. Um, and then the post qualifying precipitation event inspection may be done during either of those 24 hour periods or within the subsequent 48 hour period after those two. So essentially extend, uh, doubling the amount of time that is allowed for the post um, qualifying precipitation event inspection. Uh, we often receive comments kind of uh, requesting clarity on who can perform what inspections. So this uh, table here kind of identifies the different inspection types and then the various roles um, that are for qualified stormwater professionals. So as you can see, qualified SWIP developers can perform pretty much any inspection, while the qualified SWIP pr practitioner can um, perform weekly, pre-precipitation, during precipitation, post-precipitation, um, and then monthly inspections for uh, the 
capital projects. And then um, delegates can also do some of the inspections that the qualified TWIP practitioners can do. Um, however, there are certain responsibilities that uh, are required for the practitioners. So the pre-precipitation event is one of those. Um, there's also uh, the monthly inspections required for QSDs and qualified, or sorry, qualified TWIP developers and practitioners, um, as well as um, a post numeric action level exceedance inspection, which is also required for uh, QSDs and QSBs. Okay. Um, so now we'll move on to the sampling requirement uh, changes. So staff made the following changes to risk level two and three stormwater sampling requirements um, in response to comments. We removed the uh, requirement to sample within the first two hours of the storm event and the proposed 15 minute interval between uh, individual pH and turbidity sampling. So this allows a little bit more flexibility for the sampler to collect their uh, three sampling, uh, their three samples per discharge location. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We also clarified the non-visible sampling trigger language as a failure to implement best management practices a best management practice breach, failure, or malfunction, or a spill or leak from a container um, containing a pollutant. Uh, we also redefined what the, how the daily average is calculated. Um, it is required to be calculated for each sampling location and requires um, a minimum of three samples rather than um, averaging the samples for the entire site. Finally, in attachment D, staff removed the non-visible indicator monitoring requirements as they applied to rare situations where um, unknown substances were released. All potential pollutants are required to be determined prior to the construction um, as part of the pollutant source assessment, and they have to be listed in the SWIFT. So this figure represents um, kind of a 24-hour period divided into four six-hour quarters. To demonstrate um, when qualifying precipitation or precipitation event sampling um, can be performed. The first quarter represents um, the 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. interval with a precipitation event beginning at 4 p.m. Sampling could occur between 4 p.m. and dusk, um, assuming that those are the regular, regular operating hours, um, or the sampler could wait until the next day. The next quarter represents 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. interval, where there would likely be no um, site visits or sampling due to darkness or non-operating hours. Continuing to the third quarter, um, which represents 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. Um, on the day after the storm began, sampling could occur between the first light and 9 a.m., assuming that operate, uh, operating hours begin. And then the last quarter represents the time from um, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and sampling may be done anytime before 4 p.m. to capture the uh, initial 24 hour period of the precipitation event. Okay. Now we'll move on to the proposed notice of non applicability criteria. So we made some updates here um, as follows Staff acknowledges that SMARTS um, needs to be updated to accommodate the notice of non applicability requirements and shall be updated to accept all necessary um, submissions by the effective date of the construction form auto general permit. Staff removed the requirement mandating that app applicable regional water boards sign written documentation that concurs with the discharge determination that their site does not discharge to waters of the U.S. and subsequently qualify for a notice of non applicability. Staff revised language to state that the notice of non applicability is now only available when the site's physical location is not hydrologically connected to waters of the US. The previous notice of non applicability eligibility requirement um, stated that there had to be no stormwater um, or non stormwater discharges to waters of the US in order to qualify. Staff revised um, that the written determination or sorry, staff revised written determination to a no discharge technical cool report, which is kind of aligned with the industrial stormwater general permit. And that no discharge technical report um, can be uh, prepared by a California licensed professional engineer or professional geologist 
with relevant hydrologic ex expertise to um, develop that report. And so, all right, moving on to proposed changes for the notice of termination. Staff removed the elevation contour requirement from the final site map to alleviate the burden of hiring a surveyor to generate information that does not add to the protection of water, qual water quality in a meaningful way. Um, staff also revised the final stabilization definition in the glossary so that it's consistent with the um, final stabilization conditions outlined in the order itself. Furthermore, staff clarified that in areas where there is naturally low vegetation, 70% of the natural conditions of the local undisturbed areas is acceptable as vegetative cover. Okay. There were some um, revisions to the proposed passive treatment requirements as well. One of the most common comments that we received was that the definition of passive treatment was located in the order, attachment G, and the glossary, and that the definitions were not consistent with each other. Uh, staff revised the permit so that the definitions are consistent and removed part of the definition regarding pumps being used for dosing and application of the treatment chemicals. Uh, generally, we consider that um, these pumps being used for dosing and application to be more of an active system. Staff also revised which polyacrylamides or PAMs are acceptable for use so that products containing emulsion-based polymers that are absent of nonophenol and nonophenol ethoxylates are no longer prohibited. The previous draft of the uh, passive treatment requirements required that dischargers hire a contractor to implement the passive treatment plan. However, this has been revised to trained person, um, or to a trained person knowledgeable in the principles and practices of passive treatment. Uh, no specific training requirements are included as the discharger's best interests um, are to hire a competent individual that will be uh, implementing the requirements as uh, drafted. Um, and then you may recall from previous workshops that the State Water Board has contracted with the Office of Water Programs um, at Sacramento State University to conduct a literature review and prepare a report of their findings and recommendations for the use of passive treatment um, at construction sites. Additionally, the Office of Water Programs prepared guidance and is validating dosing calculators um, and a residual chemical testing uh, method that dischargers may use when implementing passive treatments uh, at their construction sites. The Office of Water Programs has not finalized the report of findings and recommendations as of the release of the uh, March 2022 draft. Um, and now we're going to be discussing proposed post-construction requirements. Staff removed the requirement for dischargers located in phase one of phase two municipal separate storm sewer system jurisdictions to comply with post-construction requirements that are equivalent or more stringent than the permit's post-construction requirements. Um, this requirement was removed because it is uh, sort of subjective and unreasonable for dischargers to verify if the MS4 and PDS permit um, post-construction requirements were less equivalent or more stringent than the uh, requirements of this general permit. Dischargers located within a phase one or phase two um, MS4 jurisdiction are subject to the post-construction requirements of that jurisdiction. The State Water Board received several comments that the permit was requiring dischargers to use low impact development features as a means of complying with the permits post-construction requirements. Um, staff revised the permit to clarify that the state water board recognizes low impact development as a potential post-construction best management practice capable of meeting the water balance requirements of this general permit. Uh, staff removed the requirement to demonstrate that non-structural practices are technically feasible, economically impractical, and that structural controls are better um, or serve as better protection against water quality impacts if non-constructural controls cannot properly manage the stormwater stormwater runoff volume. Um, this requirement added unnecessary administrative burden on dischargers um, when structural controls can be perfectly acceptable post-construction um, controls to achieve the water balance. Um, there were some changes to the qualified SWIP developer and practitioner responsibilities as well. In general, staff sought to clarify that the permit 
um, identify what responsibilities uh, such as drafting plans, inspecting and sampling are expected to be performed by qualified SWIFT developers um, and practitioners, as well as the delegates. The proposed permit also specifies when qualified SWIFT developers and practitioners are to review the new permit requirements and recertify their certifications. Um, qualified SWIFT developers and practitioners certified through the California Storm Water Quality Association will have to recertify prior to the expiration of their certificate, while um, qualified SWIFT developers and practitioners who self-certify through the state water board will, will need to recertify um, within one year of the effective date of the reissued construction from water general permit. Okay. Um, there are also some proposed changes to the reporting requirements. Staff removed the photo documentation requirement to address the technical challenge of reporting photo documentation um, when an inspection was missed or sampling was missed. The May 2021 draft previously required dischargers to provide um, the amount of time that was elapsed be um, between the previous storm event, and staff revised this requirement to instead read the date of the end of the, or to read date of the end of the qualifying precipitation event. Um, to simplify record keeping and improve database flexibility with um, or when documenting weather data. And in general, SMARTS will be updated to conform um, to this general permit requirements by the effective date of the general permit. The May 2021 draft previously required that dischargers determine the um, soil erodibility or K factor and length slope or LS factor um, as part of a risk determination, use the same method, which is either the GIS method um, or GIS map method or the individual method. Uh, staff revise the risk determination requirements so that dischargers have more flexibility and can use a combination of the GIS and individual methods to determine their K and LS factors. Additionally, staff revise requirements so that the qualified SWIFT developer may perform a sieve analysis to determine the site-specific K factor. Um, as well as calculate the LS factor, which these activities were previously limited to professional engineers or geologists. Determin determination of these factors um, is not over overly complicated and does not require an engineering or geology background. Uh, staff received many comments regarding changes to the routine ma maintenance definition, which was originally meant to clarify how we currently regulate maintenance projects for road, roadway projects. Under the current permit, regulators consider projects that remove pavement and base aggregate down to the subgrade erodible soil to go beyond um, routine maintenance. That is if it's over an acre of disturbance or one acre or more of disturbance. Um, staff specified that the additional clarification applies to paved roads and not dirt roads. Uh, Staff replaced pervious subgrade with erodible subgrade. And um, essentially why we did that was using pervious subgrade um, did not address the construction stormwater general permits concern of preventing sediment from entering stormwater runoff as the language um, mainly addressed stormwater infiltration. Uh, the language was updated to erodible subgrade to align with one of the main purposes of the permit, which is to control sediment discharges to receive waters. Discharges who expose the subgrade of underlying soil have the potential to um, uh, erode that soil, which can transport sediment into runoff. And um, this is why it's not considered routine maintenance and requires permit coverage if disturbing one or more acres of land. Staff also reinserted um, line and grade back into the routine maintenance definition. Um, and specifically, we added line back in there because uh, routine, the routine maintenance definition uh, in the order and the glossary uh, were not consistent. Moreover, maintaining the original line and grade of a project or road is crucial in differentiating between routine maintenance or an activity requiring separate permit coverage. And here in the end. Uh, in attachments D and E, staff clarified that the 50-foot surface water buffer requirement does not apply to sites where the creation of the buffer is infeasible, um, as the term is 
the, as the, inter, the term infeasible is defined in the gospel. Footnote five within that section um, specifies that a buffer is not required for water, uh, water body dependent instruction projects permitted under a section 404 um, of the Clean Water Act and sites where there's no natural buffer uh, or work, sorry, and sites where no natural buffer exists, such as um, concrete channelized water courses. Um, it is further noted that in water work may be regulated under section 401 or 404 of the Clean Water Act or section 1602 of the California Fish and Game Act. Um, the proposed surface water buffer requirements allow the discharger to use Russell 2, um, which is a soil a sediment loss uh, model, or other methods approved by the regional water boards to demonstrate that the sediment load um, reductions are equivalent to a 50 foot buffer in, uh, or to a natural 50 foot buffer in areas where best management practices are necessary to achieve the equivalent sediment load reduction. Okay, and this is one of the, the last big sections that we'll be covering here, um, which is the proposed total maximum daily load implementation requirements. So kind of, uh, in general, staff received many comments regarding the TMDL implementation requirements and staff did their best to clarify when dischargers are considered responsible for complying with those implementation requirements. Um, some commenters requested that additional TMDLs be implemented through the construction storm water general permit Staff reviewed the various TMDLs that they suggested and determined that only one, the Santa Monica Bay Beaches Bacteria TMDL, applies to construction stormwater discharges. Staff originally um, reviewed this TMDL back in 2018, but used an outdated document that did not specify um, construction stormwater as a source of bacteria, and therefore it was excluded from the previous drafts. However, um, the Santa Monica Bay Beaches Bacteria Team DL was revised prior to 2018 to include construction from water discharges as a source of bacteria, and therefore it has subsequently been included in this permit for implementation, which is basically to comply with the permit and focus on bacteria um, or focus on best management practices that address bacteria. Uh, Staff also retranslated nitrogen-based nutrient waste allocations from numeric effluent limitations into numeric action levels as research into available best management practices demonstrated that denitrification and bioretention ponds are the only best management practices known to achieve the numeric effluent limitations. Denitrification and bioretention ponds are not practical nor appropriate for construction stormwater discharges, which are temporary and relatively short-term. Furthermore, certain TMDLs attributed most of their nutrient loading to the wastewater treatment or reclamation plants, while stormwater sources required further um, evaluation as a loading source. Um, and then after re-reviewing the Choyas Creek Metals TMDL, staff determined that the waste allocations for copper, lead, and zinc were actually assigned as dissolved concentrations rather than total concentrations of the metals um, within the discharge. The dissolved concentrations were developed using site-specific water effect ratios. Um, so just a brief overview of TMDL sampling requirements. So all three of the following conditions need to be met in order to trigger TMDL sampling to assess compliance with the numeric action level or numeric effluent limitation. If any of these conditions um, is not met, then the TMDL sampling is not required by the discharge. First, the construction project needs to discharge to a TMDL listed water or watershed. Second, the pollutant source assessment needs to identify a TMDL specific pollutant with a waste of allocation translated into a numeric action level or numeric effluent limitation. And that pollutant has to have the, the potential to discharge into the listed water body or watershed. And then third, non-visible pollutant sampling needs to be triggered. And as mentioned before, non-visible pollutant sampling is triggered when there's a failure to implement best management practices. There's been a, a leak or spill from a container or um, a best management practice has a breach failed or not functioned. If the spill, leak or breach is not fixed and cleaned prior to discharge um, and best management practices are not implemented, then non-visible pollutant sampling is required. 
However, if the spill leak or breach is immediately cleaned and best management practices are in place to control pollutants um, are, are, and, and they're being implemented prior to discharge, then non-visible pollutant sampling is not required. Um, and then uh, basically we added more of this guidance into uh, fact sheet section IG3 uh, to provide dischargers with um, additional clarity. Okay. Um, so these are some of the limited scope public comment items uh, that we're seeking written comments on. Uh, the following updates have been made to the Los Angeles area lakes TMDL and the Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbor Waters TMDL and attachment H. Staff created a sediment based compliance method for these TMDLs. And the following slides will further discuss the method in detail. Uh, staff revised the numeric effluent limitations for metals, organic, uh, organochlorine, pesticides, and PCBs that are listed in these TMDLs into a sediment based numeric effluent uh, TMDL that is established at 100 milligrams of total suspended solids. Um, and then furthermore, the uh, several of the TMDLs that were previously translated as numeric ethyl limitations for nitrogen-based nutrients were retranslated into numeric action levels. Um, and, and I described this earlier. Uh, so um, going back to the sediment-based compliance method, there's sort of two parts. The first part was already described, which is the retranslation of the specific pollutant numeric effluent limitations into a um, total suspended solid numeric effluent limitation set at 100 milligrams of TSS. The second part of that is um, requiring a pollutant source assessment at the forefront of the project for dischargers in the LA area lakes and Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbor waters TMBL watersheds. Um, the soil sampling protocol has been modified from the United States Environmental Protection Agency um, Superfund Soil Screening Guidance. So the method requires a minimum of four three-point composite samples with the total number of samples dependent on parcel size. The figure shows how an individual um, could sample uh, based on randomly uh, subdividing the parcel and numbering the subdivisions and using a random num number generator to determine where samples should occur. Um, so essentially the dischargers are expected to create a grid um, based on the scale of their project. They would obtain their three-point composite sample from each quarter acre at a random location, and then ensure that the ran random sample locations are uh, picked by using a random number generator. Uh, they can hand sample three portions or use um, equipment to collect the samples. Um, at six inches, 12 inches, and 18 inches below surface and consolidate those into one single sample. Um, then they would analyze these samples um, using the appropriate uh, EPA approved methods for the TMDL pollutants. Um, and so depending on what those analytical results um, output, then the discharger may or may not have to comply with the numeric effluent limitation for, for total suspended solids. So this flow diagram depicts the organochloride pesticides and PCB analytic results, or sorry. Um, oh, so this flow diagram depicts that the organochloride pesticides and PCB analytic results will be compared to the reporting limit for the respective pollutants and that the metal results will be compared to the numeric effluent limitations um, or the waste of allocations that were previously included as numeric effluent limitations, numeric effluent limitations in the permit. If either standard is exceeded, then sampling for to total suspended solids as a proxy numeric effluent limitation will be required um, for the duration of the project and is triggered by the non-visible pollutant quantity. Okay. Uh, moving on to training requirements. Staff added a requirement for qualified SWIP developers and practitioners certified through um, the California Stormwater Quality Association um, to uh, take six hours of continuing education annually to remain in good standing with their certification. Staff agreed that continuing edu 
transportation is important, especially considering how best, manages, uh, best management practices are constantly evolving. Staff also revised the process in which new qualified SWIFT developer and SWIFT practitioner prerequisite courses um, can be recommended to the state water board uh, for consideration. The May 2021 draft permit originally proposed that only trainers of record um, could recommend new pre prerequisite courses, which was unnecessarily uh, limited. So now anyone can recommend uh, a course to the state water board. And it will be evaluated by the uh, instructions from water general training team uh, to determine if it meets the criteria for uh, a prerequisite. Qualified SWIFT practitioners, pre ah, sorry, qualified SWIFT practitioners opting to delegate responsibilities to other individuals are required to provide training to those individuals based on guidelines that are prepared by the construction general permit training team. Um, the proposed permit includes foundational training courses, such as roles and responsibilities, forecast information and reporting, as well as site-specific training for visual inspections, sampling procedures, and or uh, SWIFT development and implementation and best management practice implementation. Which um, essentially, uh, the, the, QS, the qualified SWIFT practitioner is only expected to train the delegate based on the activities that they are assigned. Um, staff find that this requirement is necessary to ensure that the delegates are properly implementing the um, stormwater management practices to comply with the permit. And this is our last slide. Um, and one of the, and the last um, limited scope public comment item. So uh, staff included anti-degradation findings um, into the order of the permits. Um, basically, there are two main components to the anti-degradation findings. One addresses waters that are not high quality, and the others address waters that are. For waters that are not high quality, the federal anti-degradation policy requires that existing in-stream uses and the level of water quality necessary to protect the existing uses are maintained and protected. This permit is designed to um, meet that standard. Including the uh, by re including requiring compliance uh, via receiving water limitations, um, the new total maximum daily load implementation requirements, and then uh, requirements for new dischargers proposing to discharge to impaired water bodies. These requirements are designed to halt any further degradation of the impaired water bodies and improve water quality to a level protective of existing uses as soon as possible. The permit is also designed to be protective of high quality waters. And we anticipate that discharges authorized by this general permit will not degrade high quality waters. However, if any such degradation happens, the findings discuss the requirements of the permit and find that any such uh, discharges would comply with the state and federal anti-degradation requirements. Uh, the discharges authorized here are necessary and lack cost-effective uh, alternatives. Many construction projects are essential and cannot be relocated. Uh, they support important economic and uh, social development goals of the states. So complete retention is generally not technologically or economically feasible um, a majority of the time at construction sites. Uh, adding costs like these would have negative effects on many necessary construction projects um, or um, completely halt them. So ultimately, this permit requires compliance with a wide range of pre-existing new and improved requirements that will result in the best practic practicable treatment or control of the re regulated discharge necessary to assure that a pollution or nuisance um, will not occur in the highest quality waters consistent with the maximum benefit um, to the people of the state. All right, so that was a lot. Um, but we will go ahead and move on to the question and answer portion. Yeah, thank you so much, Brandon. Um, that's a lot of information to uh, speak all at once out to our folks here. Um, we're a little bit behind on schedule, but let's go ahead and try to make up for that time. We will answer some questions between now and 1030, and then we'll take that short break as mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. So um, I'm going to start uh, at the top and answer questions, uh, I'm sorry, present questions to Brandon and the team um, in chronological order. 
Um, I also wanted to reiterate some answers I've already provided in the chat um, to make sure that they get on the recording. So the very first question we got was from John Tarofska. John, Tur oh, I'm so sorry, John. It's always a challenge. Um, anyway, John asked, um, does that mean that projects that submit NOIs through June 30th, 2023 are covered automatically under the 2009 permit until July 1st, 2026? And I responded to John in the chat and uh, to everyone. And I said, if the notice of intent is processed and a waste discharge identification number is issued prior to that uh, effective date, then yes. And assuming that the board adopts the permit with the proposed July 1st, 2023 um, effective date, then yes, that would be correct. Um, you would have until July 1st, 2026 uh, to be covered under the 2009 permit. Um, the next question was from Gwen. Uh, she said, it is unclear whether uh, which notice of termination requirements that projects with continued 2009 coverage but submitting an NOT after the new permit effective date are subject to. And I responded and said, if you continue coverage under the existing permit, which is the 2009 permit, um, we'll refer to it both ways throughout this uh, presentation, you will be subject to the notice of termination requirements of the existing permit. If you apply for coverage and receive your waste discharge identification number after the effective date of the new permit, you will be subject to the notice of termination requirements of the new permit. So um, the next question I will uh, uh, pass to you, Brandon, to answer is what about dewatering of stormwater? Does dewatering and permit only address non-stormwater, groundwater? Um, yes, so the dewatering requirements apply to many different discharges, um, including dewatering of stormwater. Uh, however, the requirements of this permit only apply when the regional water board doesn't have an existing dewatering permit already. Um, so they might have a MPDS dewatering permit, um, a de minimis permit, or a low threat permit um, that applies to the discharge uh, from the construction site. So, does that answer the question? I believe it did. Um, okay, also on dewatering, uh, can you please clarify if the dewatering is allowed for ponded stormwater after rain events? or is it just groundwater encounters? It would include um, ponded stormwater as well. Great, thank you. Um, okay, another question, it's a scenario here. If you are replacing a culvert and you pump water around the work zone, um, stream diversion, water can still collect in a dewatered work area due to seepage around work area isolation or groundwater. Typically this water is pumped out and goes through passive filtration. Would that, requiring, would that require dewatering information in the notice of intent or SWIFT? So I think uh, um, the scenario is if there's ponded stormwater that um, has been pumped out and gone through passive filtration, would that require dewatering information in the NOI or SWIFT? Um, seems like a site-specific question, but I would lean towards, yes, that would be uh, that sort of activity should be identified in the strip. Um, and it might be identified in two places actually because it's relying on passive treatment as well. Correct, yeah. So um, all of that information should always be in your SWIP, Lisa. Um, it is a site specific question. So it does depend on whether that water would be subject to dewatering requirements. Um, the requirements in this permit uh, typically apply to water as it's being discharged. Um, and so it kind of depends on, you know, uh, where that water has been, uh, has it been pumped through a passive treatment system as Brandon mentioned, is it then ponded again, or does it, you know, immediately discharge from uh, the filter system, et cetera. So um, short answer, you should always have all that information in your SWIP. Um, but the site specific conditions could mean you have uh, different requirements depending. Um, so we had a question about is broadband exempt from the post-construction requirement? And this question I believe came from um, a state agency in regards to um, the uh, 
installation of broadband internet throughout the state. Um, and so we know that Caltrans is to install broadband during all active construction. Um, and we have discussed this. Uh, so isolated installation of broadband separate from an active construction project um, that only involves the trenching. So um, typically about a one foot wide trench, um, which does not typically trigger the CGP unless added up those trenches meet the one acre or more um, of land disturbance. So if that trenching is isolated from another construction project and it's just for the installation of broadband, that could be considered a linear utility project um, under the construction stormwater permit. And so um, those would be permitted through this permit, a little bit of a different mechanism in SMARTS, um, but if it truly meets the definition of a linear utility project, it would then be exempt from post-construction. Okay, sorry, I jumped in and answered that one, Brandon. That's right. um, <laughs> another one for you. So uh, for a project that receives a, a WDID before July 1, 2023, but they experience some delay to the construction schedule that then needs to submit a change of information to extend the permit coverage for additional time, but will still be completed before June 30th, 2026, then will the COI, the change of information, still be approved under the 2009 permit requirements? The answer is yes. Yeah, uh, with the caveat that, you know, it could be site specific, our changes of information are reviewed and approved um, by the regional boards. And so um, they will take a look at that as they always do with changes of, inf of information and verify that that's correct. But yes, if that is the circumstance and the regional board um, reviews and approves that change of information, you will be under the 2009 permit requirements. Um, so the next question here is given the new definitions of a qualifying rain event or qualifying precipitation event and the expanded range for a pre-event inspection, is the State Water Board intent that the pre and post storm inspections frequently be combined with the weekly inspections to further increase efficiency, or are these required to be separate standalone inspections? Um, it is our, or it are, uh, I don't know how to phrase that, but um, yes, weekly inspections, or sorry, yes, pre and post qualifying precipitation event inspections also qualify as weekly inspections. Um, and they can also, or they can also qualify as the QSP's monthly inspection. Um, and, and I guess the same thing goes for the monthly inspection that would also qualify as a weekly inspection. Great, thank you. Um, we have a comment here, attachment B glossaries, um, ending of forecasted precipitation event. Uh, differs from the defined ending of a qualified precipitation event. Um, Brandon or Cabe, do you want to uh, take a shot at answering if there's a discrepancy there and, and what that might be if we can clear it up? They said it was under the... Oh, sorry, Cabe is muted. Let me unmute Cabe here. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have that glossary right in front of me, but um, but uh, if, if there is a discrepancy, the language is going to read that it's going to be uh, two consecutive 24-hour periods where there is less than 0.25 inches of rain forecast. And then the post inspection can be done either on those two days when that less than a quarter inch is predicted or in the following 48-hour period. So that's the standard. I'm not. I'm not sure how it's exactly written in the glossary, but that will be the standard going forward. Yeah, and Gwen, if there's a discrepancy or a difference um, there that was an oversight, we'll make sure to correct it. So thank you for that pointing for pointing that out. Um, and then Melissa asked, "Will the slides be available after the workshop?" Absolutely, Melissa. We will post the slides as well as a recording of this presentation, including the question and answer session. Um, we had some problems with that 
uh, webcast. So we'll try to get that out as soon as we can. So the folks that weren't able to join via Zoom can also see the information as well as the question and answer period. In general, it takes us about um, a week or two to post the slides due to accessibility standards. Um, but yeah. we, we can, usually when we have the, the YouTube um, recording that, that gets posted within the, the next couple yeah. of days. And because of the mix up, we'll try to expedite um, getting this presentation posted. But yeah, as Brandon said, um, we're a state agency. And so we have to make sure that we meet um, the requirements for accessibility uh, before we can email or post uh, the presentation, but we will work on that. Um, okay, uh, will the revised permit specifically address uh, snow events versus rain events? Um, the revised permit would consider both to be precipitation events um, and therefore uh, say the snow generates runoff via snow melt um, those would be uh, potential sampling events. Correct, yeah. So um, this permit regulates discharges of stormwater um, and we include discharges of snow in that definition. Of course, it's usually once the snow has melted that it discharges, um, but that's why we changed the name from qualifying rain event to qualifying precipitation event to be more inclusive because we do realize there are parts of California that qu get quite a bit of snow. Um, another place that we've addressed it is in the inactive project sites uh, area of the permit where um, we've more clearly uh, allowed folks to winterize sites um, and make them inactive when there is snow accumulated and it is not discharging. And that reduces monitoring and inspection. Uh, requirements for right. an active sites. Right, yeah, thank you, Brandon. Okay, next question here. What is expected if the, if the predicted storm does not qualify as a forecasted precipitation within zero to 72 hours before expected? Can an inspection be performed by a qualified delegate to the QSP? Um, so if the storm doesn't happen at all, of course, the only inspection that would have been required there would be the uh, pre-qualifying precipitation event inspection, because that's based on the forecast of, of that storm. But if the storm doesn't materialize, then no further inspections would be required. Or if the storm is less than a half inch, um, then it would it, you would still have to do an inspection on the first 24 hour period of the storm. But if if it pans out that that half inch predicted storm is less than a quarter of an inch, then you would not. And I mean, that's the reason why, why we went to forecast is because otherwise you have to wait around to see if the storm is going to accumulate certain amounts. And this way um, that, that won't have to happen. So um, that's the explanation for that. Yeah, thank you, Cape. And then can that pre-storm uh, inspection be performed by a qualified delegate of the QSP? Yes, it can. Okay, great. Thank you, Cape. Um, regarding the removal of residential lots from permit coverage, um, uh, this person would appreciate clarification that this is not the exclusive means of removing coverage for these areas um, under the change of change in ownership provisions. The developer can also still terminate coverage for such areas if sold to a builder who is responsible for obtaining coverage under their own waste discharge identification number. Yes, James, thank you for that clarification. That is correct. If a builder or developer sells a large number of sites to another builder or developer, um, they would follow that change of ownership uh, requirements in provisions 3.bigf.5. Thank you, James, for citing that. Um, and what we discussed in the slides does apply only when those lots are sold to individual homeowners. Um, okay, will the new permit require the separate quarterly non-stormwater inspections for traditional projects? or are these wrapped into the other routine inspections as they are for linear utility projects? Um, it does not require uh, separate inspections. They would be wrapped into the general inspections. Sorry if that wasn't clear, um, but no, the quarterly non-stormwater discharges 
or discharge inspections um, were removed. Um, but that said, during the weekly inspections or monthly inspections, uh, the stormwater management team should be looking out for those two. Great, thank you. Um, does the QSD inspection requirements have to be performed by the original QSD author of the SWIP or may another QSD perform the inspections? Uh, another QSD can perform the inspection. Um, in fact, when there's a change in QSD that the new QSD or qualified SWIP developer has to go and inspect the site to get a, a better understanding of what's happening there. Correct, yeah. So any uh, qualified SWIP developer that has been hired by the uh, legally responsible person or it works for that company um, internally uh, need to do an inspection at the start anyway. And so they should know the site pretty well. So it does not have to be the author of the stormwater pollution prevention plan, um, but anyone that is uh, registered as a qualified SWIFT developer. Um, all right, so Courtney, thank you for the compliment. The table of inspections is a nice add. Thank you, she says. Um, also, she said she'd recommend adding all of the required inspections slash responsibilities to the table, such as the monthly inspection Brandon discussed. Um, thank you for the comment, Courtney, and we will um, take that into consideration. Um, I, I do want to take this opportunity just to mention that these uh, comments and questions that we're taking today in this workshop um, are not uh, comments directly to the board and um, may or may not have action taken in response to them. Um, and that's just kind of my uh, legal spiel, not necessarily anything to do with Courtney's comment. We will take a look at that. Um, I did want to say that uh, one of my plans for post adoption is to, uh, you know, prepare some frequently asked questions that we received via the workshops and um, via email. Um, and then part of that would be to include kind of a table of inspections um, that just, you know, just provide guidance. Yeah. And as you mentioned that, Brandon, thank you. Uh, during the implementation phase of any permit, um, we will continue uh, to provide um, guidance uh, either through our own website or we have in the past partnered with the Office of Water Programs at um, California State University Sacramento to release those CGP review documents um, that you all probably have seen over the 13 years of implementation of the current permit. Um, so we will continue to do those things too. So we always welcome your feedback. Um, okay, next question here. Um, Sean says he may have misheard the sampling daily average comment. Was it each sample location must have a daily average of three samples or was he off on that? Uh, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that every discharge location um, or that the daily average is calculated on a per discharge location basis. So it's not per site or per project, it's per discharge location. Anything to add there, Cabe? Um, no, just that, the, I mean, that is a change. We used to have it um, three samples per um, site, and now it's per discharge location. So if there's more than one discharge location, that'll, be, that'll take a little more sampling. And this is, of course, for the pH and turbidity, which is done with a meter. So it's not um, too much of an extra burden. Correct, yeah, thank you, Cabe. Um, so someone else asked, is it now three per location versus current three total and minimum one per location? And Cabe just answered that question. So yes, it's three per location. Um, okay, regarding the notice of non-applicability or NONA, um, this commenter uh, says the new requirement for not hydrologically connected to waters of the United States appears to make the permit applicable regardless of whether there is a discharge to waters of the United States, which is the threshold requirement for Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Can you explain the thinking here and the basis for the board's authority to regulate activities with no discharge? And um, I will invite, if I can, one of our attorneys to jump into this. Um, maybe Matthew, can you allow Serena and or Ryan to unmute if they're available? but I'll go ahead and start describing this. So uh, James, the notice of non-applicability is something that is available 
um, for folks to show that this permit is not applicable to them. And so when we talk about hydrologically disconnected to waters of the US as being a reason to apply for a notice of non-applicability, that is to show that while you're in the state of California and you have a construction project that may disturb um, one or more acres of uh, soil or as part of a common plan of development, um, if you do not have the ability uh, or possibility to uh, discharge to waters of the United States, you would file a notice of non-applicability saying, even though all of these other conditions are met, this permit does not apply to me because um, I'm hydrologically disconnected from waters of the United States. And it looks like maybe Serena Hi. can jump in. Yeah, Amy, I think you covered it. If anything, I, I think the comment might um, highlight some confusion for the NONA. It's an option for permittees who think this might, well, not permittees, but to dischargers who think that the permit should not apply to them. This is not a requirement that applies to all dischargers. And it's not but a form of coverage. Everything. No, yeah, it's just an explanation why the permit why they are not required to get the permit because they don't have discharges. Yes, thank you, Serena. Um, and then we had a question. Can you please explain why the board isn't accepting written comments on the entire permit since there are substantial changes throughout, the, throughout this draft, um, more than just the four items mentioned in the notice? Great question, Courtney. Um, so the reason is that uh, all of the changes that have been made to the draft between August of 2021 and now, uh, aside from the four specific items, are logical outgrowths from public comment. So we released the permit for public comment in May of 2021 uh, with comments due in August of 2021. We took all those comments, um, we went through them, we responded to each of the comments individually, um, whether that was through a change in the permit or um, saying, you know, no change is needed uh, based on this information. Um, what we realized while doing the uh, response to comments is that we're, there were these four areas that we would like to make changes to the permit documents um, that were not necessarily a logical outgrowth of the public comments that we had already received. And so we wanted to allow for uh, folks to be able to submit public comments on those four items to round out you know, the already robust uh, public comments that we've received on the rest of the documents. So that's why it's limited. Um, I'll also mention that at our board workshop um, next week, as well as the adoption for consideration, I'm sorry, the board meeting for consideration of adoption in July, um, we will be hearing oral comments um, about all aspects of the permit, but the limited scope is uh, limited to the written comments. Sorry, the written comments are limited to this, to the limited scope for items that we discussed. Okay, and then Yolanda asks, will there be any verbiage in the permit for QSP QSDs to maintain current non-expired prerequisite certifications for their certification to be valid? So um, I think she's asking, um, will we require that folks keep their prerequisites current? So if they have a um, CISEC or CESWI or um, CPESC, those are a lot of acronyms. Those are the uh, prerequisite criteria for professionals in erosion, sediment control, um, or stormwater management. Um, will we require that they maintain their status with those licenses as prerequisites for being a qualified SWIP practitioner or qualified SWIP developer? Um, I have to double check on that one, but I, yeah, let me, let me look at that one real quick. The intent, and I believe the permit language in the existing permit, um, was that you do have to maintain your underlying certifications. So whether that be through um, CESWI, CPESC, CISEC, I'm gonna miss them. I think that is the intent. Um, we also will double check with the Construction General Permit Training Team, which is the group of folks um, that 
uh, maintain and run the qualified SWIP developer and qualified SWIP practitioner uh, training requirements. Oh, here it is. So um, to remain in good standing with their certification as QSDs and QSPs registered through um, the California Stormwater Quality Association, they have to complete six hours of annual continued education, which we discussed in the the um, the presentation today. And then uh, it says this requirement can be filled in whole or in part by continuing education taken to maintain any of the approved underlying prerequisites. Um, and then they also uh, they also have to complete the online QSD or QSP renewal process every two years, including the review of materials addressed in permit implementation updates. So based on that, it does not specify that they have to maintain their under um, their underlying prerequisite. But in order to get the six hours, part of that could be maintaining their uh, prerequisite. So. Okay. Great, thank you, Brandon. And even though I set an alarm on my phone, I just blindly ignored it, which is a good indicator of what kind of person I am. Um, but it is break time. Uh, we've gone a little bit over. Uh, I'd like to suggest that maybe we have an eight minute break and come back at 1045. Does that work, Brandon? Yep. Okay, great. Um, thanks folks. We're gonna take an eight minute break, come back at 1045 and we will continue answering questions.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, let me just make sure Brandon is back. I see him. Wonderful. Um, okay, so we will just pick up where we left off. Um, someone asked, please explain what is a self certified QSD? Oh, sure. So a self certified QSD is someone who has a um, California. Uh, a California or is registered through the state of California as a professional engineer or professional geologist, and they actually do not need to go through the same requirements as um, someone who certifies through CASPER. Um, and so they um, basically self-certify by completing a review um, on SMARTS, and then they'll that'll uh, they'll generate a um, certificate number that will serve as their QSD and QSB license, or sorry, certification. Right, and then we'll reiterate too, because this question comes up uh, frequently and has since the program began, but all QSDs are also uh, qualified SWIP practitioners. Um, so uh, if you meet the qualifications of a qualified SWIP developer and you either go through the training and register through CASQA or you self-certify uh, via SMARTS if you're a professional engineer or professional geologist licensed by the state of California, then you are also a qualified SWIP practitioner. Um, question from Leanne here, will current QSDs and QSPs be notified of when or how they must recertify by their certification issuer? Um, likely, yes. Uh, we haven't decided on the exact mechanism of how to do that, but I think that's a, a good suggestion that we should be able to accommodate. Yeah, so everyone will be required to recertify, Leanne. Um, the folks that are self-certified in SMARTS, we will probably just send an email through SMARTS to those uh, QSDs and then any active qualified SWIP developers and qualified SWIP, SWIP practitioners that are listed in the Office of Water Programs uh, website listing, uh, we will notify them that way. Um, okay, so we love a good reference to the permit. So let's get going here. Attachment E2, section D2D, last sentence. Um, however, dischargers must use the same method to calculate the soil erodibility K and length slope LS factors was not removed to allow combined use of methods. Um, Gwen, thank you for noticing that. Uh, Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is an oversight. Uh, we did mean to allow combined use of methods. That is correct. Um, okay, so slide 43, um, there was a photo, uh, and Mel, let me just tell you, we used some stock photos to build out this presentation uh, just for nice visuals. So uh, I want to caveat it that any photos in the presentation are not of actual projects and are not meant to illustrate anything on that slide. So um, Mel, does see, Mel does say, I see base looking material, does that mean that the photo shows routine maintenance since the excavation does not go down to the erodible subgrade? Sorry, I missed that one. Um, no worries. Oh, <laughs> no worries. Were they referring uh, to the photo in the- Slide 43, there is a photo um, that had base looking material in it. And so she was asking, does that mean that the photo shows routine maintenance since the excavation does not go down to the erodible subgrade? Uh, if that was the interpretation of what was happening in the photo, then yes. Um, I, I didn't sp spend too much uh, attention to what was actually happening in the photo other than it was a roadway project. Um, but if the, basically if the image was showing that only base aggregate was being exposed by the removal of the asphalt layer, then that would be considered routine maintenance. If the photo was showing that uh, it was actually the subgrade soil that's erodible, then that would not be considered. And then as a follow-up, I think it came through around the same time when we had that slide up. Um, Claudia is wondering, is aggregate base considered erodible subgrade? Um, by our definition, no. Okay, uh, another Nona question. Again, that's notice of non-applicability. 
if a project su successfully files a notice of non-applicability for the construction stormwater general permit, but is located in an area covered by a municipal phase two permit, would municipal phase two post-construction requirements still apply? That's a great question, Anne. I'll jump in here, Brandon, if that's okay. Um, I have a little bit of municipal experience. Um, so the NONA, as mentioned before, is not a um, type of uh, permit enrollment or permit coverage under the construction stormwater general permit. Um, and so that does not uh, make any um, assumptions or requirements for you. Uh, if you successfully file a notice of non-applicability. Um, if you are in a municipal phase two permit area, you are subject to that municipality's construction uh, requirements and regulations. So if they require post-construction for projects of your size and scope, then those would apply. Um, it's site specific in that manner. Um, Okay, that's not a question. Um, next question. Uh, William was asking uh, when the video will be posted. Um, as mentioned, as soon as we can post it, um, meeting the accessibility requirements um, in state and federal law. Um, okay, natural buffer question, something new. Um, so Robert asks, based on the updated language related to natural buffer requirements, are projects subject to section 401, 404, and 1600 permits? And those are uh, federal um, Clean Water Act sections uh, and different types of permits, um, such as flood control channel construction slash improvements be exempt from CGP coverage. So based on the natural buffer requirements, are 401, 404, and 1600 permits exempt from CGP coverage? Um, well, they wouldn't be exempt from CGP coverage. They would just be exempt from having to maintain the 50-foot buffer because that's covered in those um, in the 401, 404, and 1600. So th that element of the CGP wouldn't apply to them, but it would apply to their um, their 401 certification or, or 404. And that's a great point, Cabe. If your project has coverage under the Construction Stormwater General Permit, but you also have a 401 certification, a 404 or a 1600, uh, section 1600 permit. Um, those are different requirements. And this permit does not um, say that you are exempt from any of those permits or their requirements. Um, they act separately. And so you'll just want to make sure that you're following all of the guidelines. Um, but yeah. yes, Cape's correct. The uh, natural buffer requirements are not meant to replace or exempt you from any other type of permit requirements or certifications. And I paused just a little bit in case our legal team wanted to jump in, but I think we're good. Um, okay, so this is um, kind of a loaded question and we'll get to all of it, um, but it's from Cody, who's a friend to the program. We hear from Cody frequently, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Cody wants to know, what are the policy and scientific justifications for changing the nitrogen-based numeric effluent limitations to numeric action levels? Um, and this is one of those limited scope uh, public comment items. And Cody asks, if the TMDLs list construction as a source of these pollutants, but the data shows they are not, then wouldn't the proper action to be to modify the TMDLs, not the permit obligations? And if the sites are sources of nutrient pollution, then shouldn't these stay as numeric effluent limits instead of numeric action levels? So there's a couple of things uh, here, Cody. Um, one is that TMDLs are um, established either by US EPA or at the Regional Water Board and adopted into their basin plans. And that is a completely separate um, board procedure and um, carries with it a separate um, process and timeline and all of those things. And so what we've done in the construction stormwater general permit is we have 
um, taken those existing total maximum daily loads that are um, in the basin plans, uh, either uh, developed by US EPA or by the regional boards, and we have to implement them in our permitting actions. And so uh, in terms of process, uh, it's um, not easy or, <laughs> or very feasible to modify the total maximum daily load. And that is not a part of the permit reissuance process. So part of it is that we're just meeting our um, legal and regulatory obligations to implement the total maximum daily loads. Um, for the scientific justifications and policy justifications for changing the nitrogen-based um, waste load allocations from numeric effluent limitations to numeric action levels, um, we took a look at each of the TMDL uh, listed pollutants, their waste load allocations, um, the staff reports from when the TMDLs were being developed, um, as well as many other <laughs> considerations that we made. Um, so for the um, nutrient-based parameters that were changed from numeric effluent limitations to numeric action levels. Those are very uh, specific watersheds. We looked at the TMDLs and how they were written. Uh, we determined what type of discretion the State Water Board had in interpreting and implementing requirements to meet those total maximum daily loads. And um, the long story is that the total maximum daily loads were written in a way that showed that the sources of uh, nitrogen-based uh, nutrient pollutants were from uh, wastewater treatment facilities, water reclamation plants, um, and other discharges in that basin. Um, there's a long, long history to those TMDLs and how they were developed, um, which is not necessarily under the scope of this permit reissuance, but we analyzed the TMDLs uh, determined what would be an appropriate action to control what might be um, sources of nitrogen from construction stormwater. And in that um, review and analysis, we determined that the most appropriate would be numeric action levels. Um, there are few, uh, if not no, um, BMPs that are appropriate to treat uh, nitrogen compounds from construction stormwater. And so what we chose to do and said is to use numeric action levels as part of a feedback loop. We want folks to see if they have nitrogen compounds leaving their site in their construction stormwater, um, and then use best management practices um, in the best way possible to control some of those nitrogen compounds. Um, and that includes both uh, structural and non-structural best management practices. So sources of nitrogen from construction stormwater, maybe um, you know, spills or leaks of sanitary facilities. Um, it could be uh, use or historical use of fertilizers on the site. Um, and all of the permit requirements uh, require that you do a pollutant source assessment. Um, you look for these pollutants in your stormwater and then you control them using best management practices, structural or non-structural. Um, and then the numeric action level is part of that feedback loop. If you exceed the numeric action level, you need to take a look at what your best management practices are, where they might be failing, and how you can um, come back into attainment. And I know that's a very long explanation, and we'll entertain more questions on it, I'm sure. Um, does legal want to jump in here at all and either scold me and correct me or um, concur? <laughs> okay, great. Um, but we will continue those conversations, Cody, and I hope that that answered your question. Um, if not, get back in the chat there. Um, okay, so somebody's asking, what is the definition of breach for non-visible sampling? Would this include water flowing over or through a sediment control BMP? Um, Andrew, yes, we did not specifically uh, define breach as it's a, a common English word. Um, and we really only uh, define in the glossary words that we think um, need to be defined. But in this instance, yes, if water flowing over or through 
a sediment control BMP where it's not designed to do that, that would be a breach. Yeah, if I could add to that, Amy, I mean, a breach is generally, we're talking about a breach in a containment of some sort, like a retention pond, um, because a lot of BMPs like fiber rolls, for example, are designed to, to filter and have water flow through them. So that would not be a breach if water was flowing through a BMP like that. But if it was flowing um, out of a BMP that was meant to contain the, the water in some way, then that's definitely a breach. Secondary containment is an example of that around. Uh, Brandon, your, your audio is a little bit off. Can you repeat that? Sure. I, mean, I was saying uh, secondary containment is an example of a BMP uh, that might result in a breach. Correct. Yeah. So if um, the BMP is designed to contain water, um, and it overtops it, that is a breach. And I just lost my place here on the question, so give me just a second. Gosh, sorry, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Ricardo Moreno is the next one. Will you go ahead and read it for me, Cabe, so I can get back up to where we were? Sure. Uh, regarding the routine maintenance, if we have a project on a road, say two miles, and only a small portion needs repairs to the soil, can one only look at the portion that goes to the soil when, eval when evaluating the one acre threshold, or will that be considered piecemealing? Good question. Uh, my understanding is that yes, they can uh, portion it out by the amount that's actually disturbing the subgrade erodible soil. So, say your project um, has a removal and replacement that is and that goes down to the subgrade erodible soil, and it's say half an acre, and then the remainder of the uh, routine maintenance is grind and overlay, and that just resurfaces the pavement. Um, that's you know maybe 1.5 acres. Um, then that project does not need to apply for uh, um, enrollment under this general permit because it's not resulting in more one or more acres of land disturbance. Great, thank you. And I've caught up. Thank you, Cabe. Um, I also wanted to mention I got an email from our wonderful uh, program manager, the California Stormwater Quality Association, um, and she wanted to clarify that um, there is no uh, continuing education piece, but um, the permit requires one, maintaining your underlying certificate and its renewals, and two, renewal of your Q QSP qualification when it expires. And so that is for folks that register through the California Stormwater Quality Association. Um, and that is the response that they frequently send folks when they ask the same question that Yolanda had earlier. So hopefully that helps to clear it up. Um, okay, and then we have someone here saying, so many changes going to be difficult for people to understand and implement some of these topics. That's a great comment. Yes, it is it's complex. And so we're trying to do our best to help folks. Um, he said, you mentioned uh, TMDL trigger by three factors, one being non-visible pollutant sampling, but what if the water body is or has a TMDL for sediment, which is visible? Um, can you rephrase that? Yeah, or I can just answer real quick. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm reading it, it's easier for me to understand. Um, so they're asking basically, what if the water body has a TMDL for sediment, which is a visible pollutant? Mm -hmm. So um, great question. The TMDLs that we're implementing through this permit that are for sediment um, are required to comply with the permit uh, and or use Russell to modeling for sediment loss. And so those uh, TMDLs are not subject to the non-visible pollutant sampling. Um, okay, on the soil investigation, 
Do these soil sample sites require documentation via a survey or GPS coordinates to demonstrate compliance with the sampling protocol? That for Kate, you want to go ahead and answer that? Um, yeah, the sample locations aren't don't require that specific of uh, location. Um, we're, we're basing it on the sampling that was done for um, Superfund sites, and so uh, we're just breaking down a parcel into sub parcel, you know, into sub areas, and then choosing a spot within that sub area, and that's close enough for our purposes. We'll know generally what part of the, you know, of the acreage is, is uh, the sample was taken from. Yeah, and Andy, um, in terms of compliance, we have not put any language into the permit saying that you must document or upload the GPS coordinates to demonstrate compliance with the sampling protocol. Um, that being said, of course, the Regional Water Board always has the authority to ask for more information um, and uh, they may do that. Um, I think it's good scientific practice and good uh, business practice to make sure that you document everything that you're doing. Um, and so I would expect to see or want to see um, at least a narrative description of how you did the sampling in your SWIP. Um, okay. Can you please clarify if exceeding the total suspended solids numeric effluent limit counts as a single exceedance, even if that NEL represents multiple pollutants? Also, can you point us toward the technical and scientific literature that supports this change? So the first question, um, does the total suspended solids numeric effluent limit count as a single exceedance, um, even if that NEL represents multiple pollutants? So I think what Cody is asking is if you exceed total suspended solids um, when you are using that protocol for um, metals or organics, um, does that exceedance count uh, as an exceedance of each of those pollutants? Um, that's a good question, Cody. I'm not sure that we have a scenario where um, we have that protocol set up for two different types of pollutants uh, in the same watershed, but I suppose, okay, so if there's a scenario where they use the um, soil investigation protocol and have a numeric effluent for total suspended solids, let's say for copper as well as zinc, if they take one sample and that total suspended solids uh, measurement is above the numeric effluent limit, does that count as an exceedance for each of those pollutants? Yeah, it, it wouldn't, Amy, because we're using it as a proxy. So the, the TSS is the, you know, the pollutant, if you want to call it that, that, that we're then measuring for after you go through that process of, doing the, you know, the, the sediment compliance method and whatnot, um, it's, it's not gonna be broken down into the constituent parts of the TSS. The TSS is, the, is what we're measuring at that point. Correct, yeah, thank you, Cabe. Yes, the total suspended solids is the numeric effluent limitation um, and it's a proxy for those other pollutants. And so we are not measuring each of those individual pollutants uh, themselves. And then also Cody asked, can you point us toward the technical and scientific literature that supports this change? Um, yes, Cody, we have footnotes in the fact sheet um, where we discuss this protocol as well as in attachment H um, where we discuss the protocol as it relates to the organic pollutants and the uh, total metals. Um, but also, Cody will be in touch and I can send you some stuff. Uh, please feel free to email me. And that goes for anyone. You can always reach out to me and staff if you have any questions. Um, okay, so regarding non-visible pollutant sampling, please clarify whether sampling is required if a BMP breach, et cetera, results in a discharge during a rain event, but the breach is, rem is remedied prior to the next rain event. Um, one more time, please. Um, yeah. Clarify whether sampling is required if a BMP breach, et cetera, results in a discharge during a rain event, but the breach is remedied prior to the next rain event. Because if it discharged during a rain event, um, 
they would have to sample or they would have to compare that sample to um or they would have to conduct that would trigger non-visible fruit and monitoring um and then compare that sample to uh, or use the proper analysis to determine if the fruit and some qualities um that exceed the numeric action levels or numeric limitations. correct um and just another point of clarity on that so if you um, clean up the spill, uh, if there's a spill immediately and it does not discharge during a rain event, um, you do not need to do the non-visible sampling. Um, if in your uh, stated example here, James, that it is during a, a rain event, you do need to do the sampling, even if the breach is remedied prior to the next rain event, but you wouldn't need to sample for those uh, in a subsequent rain event. So once the issue has been remedied, um, I believe, or Cape, we have, you, they have to sample one more time to just to make sure, right? My, under well, my understanding is that no, they would not have to sample. Okay. But, um, for the at the during the next event they would not have to sample the they, next event yeah. okay correct yeah so yeah the name of the game is um do the sampling if it applies um and then correct that uh breach malfunction spill um failure as soon as possible so amy asks why are training hours necessary when all qsds and qsps have underlying certificates they must maintain it's a great question amy um it's because this is a statewide, uh, state-specific permit, and the QSD QSP training um, modules and uh, all of the uh, materials contained in that training is specific to this permit. And so um, we want folks that have that underlying information about erosion and sediment control um, and best management practices, but then we also want that additional uh, training hours and knowledge on this specific permit, um, specific to California and all of our um, special requirements and um, local needs and, and situations. Um, okay, will current QSDs and QSPs be notified of when or how they must recertify? We already answered that question. Yes. Okay. Uh, question here from Mark. Hi, Mark. Glad you were able to join us. Um, would you please describe how you derived the 100 milligram per liter uh, total suspended solid surrogate? How did you arrive at 100 milligrams per liter? Did you perform a technology evaluation? How would 100 milligrams per liter be achieved? Also, would you please explain the figures one and two in the fact sheet, page 39? I'm having a hard time understanding what they represent. Um, we just picked it out of thin air, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's based on what research that we could find um, regarding um, the correlation between TSS and the organochlorine pesticides, which is actually pretty limited because not, there just hasn't been much research since most of those things have been banned for 40 years or more. Um, nobody seems to be that interested in doing that cor that particular correlation, but there have been some studies. Washington State has done some. Uh, they've done some here in California, not uh, on, on all of them, but it, it was determined that because of that linear relationship between um, uh, organochlorine pesticides, uh, uh, you know, ad absorbing to soil particles that 100 milligrams is, is protective of water quality. And then the other part of that is that for those things in particular, the organochlorine pesticides, we're, we're having to use the reporting limit, the method reporting limit as the standard. And if you get below 100 milligrams per liter of TSS, then you're, you're um, you're below that reporting limit. So then that the reporting limit doesn't make any sense in that case. Um, for the metals, there's been a, more research into that correlation. And 
Um, for some of them, for, for lead, it, it pretty much ends at zero, the intercept is zero in the, core, in the linear uh, regression. But for the other ones like zinc and copper, 100 milligrams represents the point where it, it goes from being suspended particles in the analyte to the dissolve phase. And so those basically those three reasons are why we we settled on the hundred. I mean, it would be more protective if we could go down lower, like to fifty or even twenty five. But I, that's really not um, achievable, which is kind of the second part of your question. A hundred um, milligrams per liter TSS is achievable with current technology, current BMP technology. And then Mark was also asking, and this might not be doable in this setting, but. He wanted you to explain the figures one and two in the fact sheet, page 39. I can pull it up if you want me to share and stop sharing. If that's, if that's easy to do, and we think it would be beneficial for the other um, 278 people on the call. <laughs> All right, is it shown? Yep, thank you, Brandon. Um, if you could make it a little bit larger, so it's single page on the screen. That would be great. Okay. So, Cabe, do you want to describe this figure a little bit? Um, yeah. So those figures, you know, granted they're not um, uh, the best, but what they show is um, what if you know using the hundred milligrams per liter. Um, how the the various analytes fall, you know, within that. So. Um, and, the, and the one that's up right now for the pesticides and, and PCB, it shows how, you know, what, what levels of those pollutants are measured when the, when the analyte amount is, a, is 100, you know, a milligrams per liter. So it, it's, I mean, they, they, those diagrams actually don't mean a lot. They just show that what we're looking for is detectable in, you know, in, in, with using that proxy. Great, really, both you. of those is what they're designed to meet. And then for the metals, we're not using the reporting limit, we're just using the NEL. And so um, this is uh, some research that, that was done, I think, in, in Germany, but it shows that uh, essentially that the NEL levels can also be met at, a, at 100, you know, using 100 milligrams per liter. And again, if you use, you know, too small of a of an amount like less than a hundred, then you're then you're starting to see only the dissolved metals in there, not the particulate metals, and so that's uh, that's what they're supposed to show. We, we probably should spend a little more time with an explanation in those before the final is actually, you know, put out. Um, thank you, Cave. And again, um, you know, with this public workshop. Um, feedback that we're hearing from you all and things that we uh, say that we might do um, are not uh, public comments or response to public comments um, at the water board level. So I just want to caveat that, but um, all of this feedback is very helpful. And we have a note taker writing down things where we might want to make um, some changes or revisions. So um, that goes with any further explanation of those uh, graphics as well. So thank you, Kate. Um, okay, question here is many underlying certs, CPESC, CISEC, and CESWI, um, which those are acronyms. I apologize, everyone. Those are um, underlying certifications for uh, erosion and sediment control or stormwater inspectors. Um, so those uh, certifications require registrants to earn annual units already. I assume those hours earned would also satisfy the six hour annual requirement for uh, qualified SWIFT developers and qualified SWIFT practitioners. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, Gwen says that the California Board of Pro uh, Professional Engineers, Land Surveyors and Geologists was not included on the list as an option for the qualified SWIFT developer applicant to need to possess. Was it removed by accident? Um, none of the uh, qualified SWIFT developers need to possess a uh, license from the California Board um, of Professional Engineers, Land, Sur Land Surveyors, and Geologists. 
Um, we'll see if there was something removed in that section, Gwen, um, but I think those were additive. So if you are a registered engineer or geologist, um, you can self-certify as a qualified SWIP developer, but you do not need to hold one of those licenses to be a qualified SWIP developer. Um, so someone said currently CF and WL, which I don't know what that means, requires implementation of EC and SC, which I think is erosion control and sediment control at 30% chance of rain. Please clarify. It might be fish and wild. I'm, I really am not sure. Um, Hamid, if that is another regulation um, or maybe a Caltrans specific um, policy, that might be why, but I'm not sure what you're referring to. Maybe we can clear that up for you via email. Um, will there be a prescribed EPA approved analytical slash sampling, sampling protocol for the pesticides in soil? These analyses will not be quick or cheap. Um, we included within attachment H the appropriate soil screen analyses um, and the associated EPA methods. Yeah, and we did go for the easiest and cheapest uh, EPA approved methods for um, the soil screening. So you can look to attachment H for that method number. Um, so question here, do the anti-degradation findings for high quality waters mean that this permit finds that all construction projects that discharge into high quality waters, no matter the project, provide maximum benefit to the people of the state? Um, good question, Cody. I will see if we can unmute one of our attorneys here. Matt, can you ask um, Serena and or Ryan to unmute? Okay, great. Hi, sorry, I, I think you can hear me now. Yes, um, thank you. So because this is a statewide permit, we have to make statewide anti-degradation findings and it's not a water body or specific or pollutant specific analysis. And instead, we made the finding that to the extent there is anti-degradation to a high quality water, which is a term of art only used in the anti-degradation policies, um, then it, it then the discharge would be to the maximum benefit of the people. But we understand that this is a new finding and if you have a comment on that, you can submit one. Yeah, those findings are part of the limited scope uh, public comment period. So um, we will be taking written comments on the anti-degradation findings. Thank you, Serena. Um, okay, will a version of the new permit be released that distinctly highlights the changes between the current 2009 permit and the final version of the new one, similar to the provided track changes version of the 2022 draft showing differences from the 2021 draft? If not, will all new slash changed requirements and permit sections be clearly documented on the board's website? Um. One reason why we haven't provided it as like like the current uh, draft permit documents where there's a direct comparison between the May 2021 draft and the March 2022 draft is because of the reorganization and just you know general changes that are so massive it, it just wouldn't be really uh, helpful to look at those because it's just hard to read. Um, uh, that said, um, our my coworker Matt. Um, did assist with cataloging um, the changes between the permits, um, and we may be able to provide that uh, later, or once the permits adopted. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. So we're not totally sure yet, Leanne. Um, we will do our level best to provide everyone the information they need to understand um, the changes between the existing 2009 permit um, and a finalized version of the reissuance. Um, and then someone was asking, does existing mean the 2009 permit? Yes, it does. Um, 
All right. So for the LA area, the total phosphorus numeric effluent limitations remain, while the, to the total nitrogen, nitrogen numeric effluent limits were revised to be numeric action levels. How come the total phosphorus NELs were not revised to be NALs? And what BMPs would be used that would meet the numeric effluent limits? A great question, Karen. Um, the reason is that total phosphorus um, is more easily treated with filtration best management practices. Um, and those best management practices are typical best management practices for construction, stormwater, um, erosion control, and sediment control. Um, we did not feel that there was um, enough evidence in the total maximum uh, daily loads to allow for us to change those from numeric effluent limits to numeric action levels. Um, and we wanted to best control uh, phosphorus as we can. And so the best management practices to be used would be um, your typical filtration best management practices and anything else that you find that might work for those pollutants um, in the CASQA best management practice manual or other commonly used uh, BMPs. Um, okay, a demolition question. Are demolition activities only covered once soil is exposed, i.e. structure is removed, then the foundation remo is removed as a separate activity? As long as there are distinct periods between the two activities, is the structure demolition not needing permit coverage? The language of the order is not clear in that. Yes, so as far as demolition activities are concerned, um, only demolition activities that are uh, that results in one or more acres of disturbance or are part of a larger common plan of development um, would require to comply with the permit requirements. Um, so if, say, there was a demolition of a structure atop a, um, like a concrete foundation or pad, um, and there was no resultant disturbance to um, land, then permit coverage is not required. Thank you. Um, and then for dewatering, what if you are regulated under a 401 or waste discharge requirements? So um, this is similar to the other 401 question. Um, this permit is not, mean, uh, is not meant to replace uh, requirements from any other permit or certification. Um, if you have a separate uh, permit for dewatering, including any statewide dewatering permits or a regional board low threat or de minimis permit, you will uh, meet the requirements of that separate permit and not the dewatering requirements of the construction general permit. And although it's not a requirement, it is helpful for regulators to um, see this visualized on, on like the uh, SWIFT map. Um, so you can indicate where your the, the portions of your project where um, 401 or 404 might apply and then where the CTP applies and if there's any areas of there. Right. And um, if you have a waste discharge requirements or any other uh, national pollutant discharge elimination system permit. Um, and I think the next question is very similar. If a discharger is covered under a statewide NPDES dewatering permit, and a project is under an active uh, stormwater pollution prevention plan. I think he means with active coverage under this permit, the construction stormwater permit, which permit supersedes and should be applied for stormwater dewatering and any other allowable discharge. So Ricardo, this is uh, similar to the last question. If you have um, another NPDES permit, whether it's statewide or a regional board um, issued low threat or de minimis NPDES permit. Um, those permits apply first and supersede. Um, if you don't have coverage under one of those permits or you're not in an area that um, issues those uh, a low threat or de minimis permit from the region, um, then you will apply the dewatering requirements of the construction general permit. Um, okay, so Bob Schultz, nice to see you on here. Um, site operating hours definition is as follows. Uh, time periods when the site is staffed to conduct any function related to the construction activity. 
So then Bob's question is, if the construction site is shut down and no construction personnel will be on site due to and during a rain event, then would the permit holder be able to conclude that the project will not need to be inspected by a qualified SWIP practitioner or delegate because there are no operating hours? That is correct. The permit does provide exemptions for when uh, or for sampling and in visual inspections, um, basically exempting those um, requirements when there are no uh, site operating hours or if it's unsafe to access the site. Right, um, but the intent is not to um, have you uh, stop your operating hours when it's raining just so that you don't have to do an inspection. Um, it should be your normal operating hours um, when staff are on site um, conducting their construction uh, activity function. Um, okay, so someone uh, said that they were late and they wanna know when the new CGP will come into effect. So we don't know yet. Um, that will be determined when the board votes to adopt the permit, but we have uh, proposed an effective date of July 1st, 2023. Um, and if the board agrees and adopts it with that effective date, that would be the effective date, July 1st, 2023. Um, okay. Is there evidence that traditional best management practices, not um, advanced treatment systems, can achieve the new 100 milligram per liter, per liter TSS numeric effluent limit? And am I reading the fact sheet correctly that this uh, total suspended solid numeric effluent limit is only in effect if certain pollutants are detected during initial site soil sampling? Um, I can answer that. The, so we don't have, um, you know, because TSS has not been um, required by in the construction general permit, we don't have construction sites in our SMARTS database. But what we did do um, to see whether or not this was reasonable, what, uh, TSS and NTU or turbidity, though, that also has a linear relationship and they're, they're closely correlated. Um, uh, it, and so somewhere between like 30 NTUs and 100 NTUs correlates to 100 milligrams per liter of TSS. And so I went back and looked at all of it, since we do you know, have all construction sites sample for turbidity, I went back and looked at all that data. And the average over the last um, you know, 10 years or so of the CGP is, was about 64 NTUs, and so that um, that tells us that uh, you know the 100 milligrams per liter TSS is is achievable. Yes, and additionally, in our industrial stormwater general permit, uh, 100 milligrams total suspended solids is a uh, numeric action level for all industrial sites, and um, they frequently use the same BMPs that you would use on a construction site to control for total suspended solids. So that has been in effect and been proven um, over the years. Um, okay. And the, the second part of that is that that's correct. It's only in effect if certain pollutants are detected and only in certain watersheds as well. It's actually a pretty limited uh, portion of the CGP that's um, you know, using the uh, alternative sampling, uh, soil sampling and, and then sampling for TSS. Correct, yeah, thank you. Okay, and I'm just doing a quick time check here. We have about 27 minutes and I'm seeing 17 questions. So I think we'll get through them. Um, if you really wanna to get a question answered, um, please drop it in the chat now and uh, we will try to wrap up at noon. Again, please reach out to us if you have any other questions or wanna provide feedback, we're always open to hearing that. So moving right along. Um, what is the specific source of the forecast that must be used for planning pre, during, and post-storm inspections. So I think where uh, where do they get that forecast information? National Weather Service. And no. Yeah, uh, Brandon's mic was a little off, but yes, it's the National Weather Service um, through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, okay. So according to our applicability flow chart in the PowerPoint, um, Mark has a question on action level and uh, effluent limit monitoring. Uh, 
Um, so they're required when there is a breach, malfunction, or failure of a BMP. There are no definitions for these actions, but they have immense compliance relevance. Why is there no definition? Um, so as I mentioned a little bit before, we chose not to define those words necessarily because they are common uh, dictionary words that we can all um, kind of look up the definition to. Um, I understand that more specificity is sometimes helpful when you are trying to uh, make sure that you are in compliance. Um, but a lot of times adding more specificity into these types of permits has an unintended effect and may affect uh, the um, enforcement of those requirements. So um, we chose to uh, rely on the English language dictionary definitions of those words. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the answer to that one. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Well, also on the, you know, the, the fact that the QSDs and QSPs are trained to know how a BMP is supposed to be working. And so they, they also know if it's failing or being breached or, or damaged or anything like that. I mean, you can't, you really can't define those terms for every single BMP. That would just be a huge glossary. Right. Yeah. And you can't anticipate every possible um, action or reaction that would lead to those things as well. Um, okay, so we have a question on qualifying precipitation event inspections. Um, quickly changing precipitation prediction amounts will complicate planning and scheduling of the inspections. Um, it may only be practical to determine if they are triggered once at the beginning of the multi-day predicted rain event. State Water Board staff may want to consider that only an initial assessment of a multi-day event will be practical to plan and schedule these inspections. So that was more of a comment um, from Rosanna. Thank you. Um, do you have anything you would like to add, Cabe, um, in clarification to that? Well, that that is what that is the intention that you do one pre-qualifying um, precipitation event inspection, and the the only thing is we extended it a little bit before because now the six and seven day forecasts are actually considerably more accurate than they were say, you know, 10 years ago when the other permit went into effect. And so um, we were going on the forecast amount, but you only need to do one inspection per forecast. And that forecast you can obtain any time up to three days before the event, well, between from five to three days before the event. Great, thank you. Um, so this is a, a comment from someone that must be local to Sacramento. Um, in October, we had more than eight inches of rain where it was predicted to be 1.5 inches, um, which did happen here in October. Um, who's responsible for the damage due to misinformation? Um, good comment, good question. Um, the discharger is responsible for compliance with this permit at their site. Um, I'm not sure what damage you are referring to, um, but it's a bit of a loaded question. Um, but this permit is set up to, uh, you know, give folks the um, tools they need to make sure that make sure that they're in compliance with um, discharges coming off of their construction site. Um, when you know the weather does crazy and unpredictable things, um, I know that folks on construction sites. Uh, do their best to adapt to that. Um, we cannot anticipate all of those things as we write regulations. Um, and so in terms of who's dis responsible for damage, depends on the damage you're discussing, um, but also, um, you know, we, we can't anticipate those times in October when we get eight inches, when one and a half inches is predicted, um, the discharger should always be checking and double checking their best management practices, um, as well as their um, site conditions and everything that's happening on site to make sure that they remain in compliance. Um, okay, attachment D section F notes that active construction must roughen slopes with large cobble or track walking. How does one perform work on a slope while protecting it with cobble or track walking? Not sure we necessarily have an answer for that. 
Yeah, I, I don't quite understand the, the question. I mean, placing cobble or track walking are, th those are common parts of, you know, common activities on construction sites, like highway construction, especially. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure who the person is that they're asking must perform the work on a slope when that's happening. I mean, all, none of that stuff happens on the entire slope all at once. So if they're talking about sampling, they would do it you know, at, at some safe place um, within that construction site. But um, I, I'm not sure, you know, who they're referring to or what work they're referring to. So I can't remember. Right, that. right. Yeah, I think um, maybe what she's asking is how do you keep a slope protected with BMPs while you're still working on the slope? And um, that's a common experience. And I think uh, what we're really intending is that for slopes that um, you're not actively working on, um, those would be protected um, and or stabilized in some manner. Um, but track walking is used for other things as well. So um, yeah, maybe if you have a site specific question, Christine, um, or an inquiry, please reach out to us. And, and reading the language, it's um, saying including but not limited to these practices such as large or roughening slopes with uh, surfaces with large cobble and track walking. So it doesn't mean that it's mandatory to use large cobble and, and track walking. Thank you for that clarification, yeah. Um, okay, so the fact sheet specifically notes that sources of nitrogen-based loading from construction sites may include existing concentrations in the sediment from past land use and storage and application of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. Can you clarify if the storage and application of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides is meant to describe past use or use during construction? So that, that specific reference, Cody, is about past land use. Um, yeah, because we're talking about existing concentrations in the sediment. And um, that would be from past land use because we are discussing uh, anything prior to um, the new construction project. If they had storage and application of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, that would be listed in their pollutant source assessment and um, make them uh, responsible to uh, follow any of the TMDL related requirements. Um, okay. Can you clarify who can perform a pre-precipitation event inspection? The table says a delegate cannot. Brandon shook his head no, but Gabe said yes. Sorry, thank you, Michelle. Yes, that was in my uh, chat log here to clarify as well. Um, it is the qualified SWIP practitioner, um, not the delegate. Um, and, and we were gonna clarify that later. So thank you for the reminder. Yeah, it's only at inactive sites that the QSB can, can delegate. I, I just kind of had my eye on that part of the permit, but I was looking at the inactive sites, not the active sites. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Cabe. It's a lot to follow as I'm sure all of the audience uh, understands. <laughs> um, okay, so notice of non-applicability requires a no discharge technical report. May the board provide an example of a no discharge technical report? Um, good question, Dahlia. Um, uh, we won't provide a, an example of a no discharge technical report in this workshop or as part of uh, the reissuance. Um, there are no discharge technical reports being implemented in the industrial stormwater general permit. So you may find one of those helpful as an example, um, but we, um, we don't want to provide an example or a template necessarily because it's a very site specific document. Um, okay. And then more questions about um, clarifying the delegate, but I think we have that all clarified now. Um, I see. Okay. There was a question, I believe, um, responding to an earlier one. If the QSD hired by the contractor can do the, uh, oh, to ask if the QSD hired by the contractor can do the inspection rather than the, the QSD that actually wrote the SWIP. The answer was yes. Um, then they were saying, my understanding is that the water pollution control manager, which is a term I believe specific to Caltrans, 
can be the QSP as minimum. Um, so you can have a qualified SWIP practitioner um, that is not also a qualified SWIP developer. And that may be the water pollution control manager, depending on your agency's um, roles and responsibilities for your projects. Um, a qualified SWIP developer that's hired by the contractor may be able to do the inspection as well, since they're also a qualified SWIP practitioner. Um, has there been confirmation on whether sites in TMDL watersheds will be required to sample constituents other than pH and turbidity? It depends on the TMDL um, watershed and what the associated um, waste allocations are. Um, so for instance, in Southern California, there are a lot of watersheds that identify um, a variety of pollutants, whether that be metals, pesticides, um, nutrients. And if your construction site discharges to those watersheds and you are a source of those pollutants, then you may be required to sample for those constituents via the non-visible pollutant monitor. Great, thank you. Um, we also had a comment about waters of the United States. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over it. Um, it's, it's, it's a comment, an explanation. So. Um, we want to make sure we answer all the questions here. Um, so Bob is asking um, if rain gauge readings will be used to modify continuing dur during storm or post storm inspections, then the permit language will need to be modified because he says that um, it appears that all rain event inspections are based on the forecast. So there is no need to monitor or record the rain gauge readings or to modify inspections based upon actual precipitation amounts at the job site. Please confirm. So the precipitation amount, that's a trigger for the inspection. The, the rain gauge uh, monitoring is a part of the inspection checklist. And so that will remain. And, and part of the reason we want it to remain is so that we can, you know, it, uh, at some point maybe correlate the amount of rain that, that happened that day with the discharge. So um, it's two different things, the, the trigger, triggering amount for the inspection and then the inspection requirements themselves are, are separate. Right. right, yeah, thank you for that clarification. Um, can there be more than one QSD assigned for a project? Yes. Okay. Um, Russell 2 has controversially rarely been accepted by a certain regional water quality control board as a basis for meeting notice of termination. Why is it written further into the permit for meeting sediment-based TMDLs? So in the existing permit, Gwen, um, regional board uh, inspectors may feel that Russell 2 is not appropriate for a notice of termination under the existing permit. Um, this is a new permit reissuance where we are implementing the Russell 2 model for soil loss um, in a number of ways. And um, the regional boards um, are generally on board with that. Um, so the reason that we are implementing Russell 2 modeling um, further into this permit to meet sediment-based TMDLs is that it is a proven method for reducing soil loss. Um, and in terms of sediment-based TMDLs, uh, that's the goal. And so we felt that it was an appropriate um, industry standard way to show that you are not contributing to um, sediment loads that are um, degrading the waters and contributing to the total maximum daily load. The established model, um, and we're not aware of other uh, sediment loss calculators that are pretty well established and can be applied over a broad uh, range yep. of projects. Yep. Um, okay. Please confirm that the six hours of continuing ed is now applicable to professional engineers who previously did not need to have continuing education for their underlying credential as a QSD QSP. So the six hours of continuing education is actually only applied to um, qualified SWIFT developers and practitioners registered through um, the California Stormwater Quality Association, CASPA. So it does not apply to professional engineers or professional geologist that self-certify. Thank you. 
Um, and then someone, oh, that was something. Okay, here we go. Uh, the board will be collecting information from the soil screening investigations that are submitted. Will the board make available data that will be collected and submitted? Will the data collected be valid for a certain duration of time? Um, that's a good question. Um, so our SMART system, the Stormwater Multi-Application Report and Tracking System, um, collects all of the sampling and monitoring data. That's where you fill out your notice of uh, intent. You will attach your um, stormwater pollution prevention plan there, and that will have uh, the results of your soil screening investigation. We are not proposing to have you um, input that data like you would uh, effluent uh, monitoring results. And so the data is available to the public. Um, it will be as part of your SWIP. And so um, as long as the uh, SWIP is up for the uh, legally required um, records retention schedule, on SMART, folks will be able to see that information. Um, that being said, uh, we are not proposing to collect that data um, in terms of having you do like an ad hoc report in SMARTS where we um, collect effluent receiving water data. Um, it's gonna be more narrative, um, but yes, it is all publicly available. Okay, and I'm seeing 28 more comments here and only about 10 more minutes. And so we'll try to get through them pretty quick. Uh, let's see. Can we discuss the difference between the LRP and the discharger and what the responsibilities are in SMARTS? Um, yes, sorry, I was blanking. I was reading the one before that. Um, so the legally responsible person is assigned by the discharger um, to act as a signatory on behalf of the discharger um, in SMARTS. So the discharger doesn't necessarily have any responsibilities um, or actions that they need to do in SMARTS. It's the LRP that will be certifying and submitting um, reports and other information collected through SMARTS. Do you want to add to that? Yes, that's great, thank you. Um, and folks, you might notice that I am skipping over a couple of questions, uh, mainly because they've either been answered already or uh, I will reach out to those folks um, individually. Um, can you confirm the on-site on -site concrete batch plants that serve only one project are covered under the CGP and would not require coverage under the IGP? Um, I do think that we clarified that. That has been an ongoing question over the last 13 years of implementation of the existing permit. Um, okay. In regards to the erodible soils for maintenance paving, I have to add for Caltrans that the asphalt that is ground off is typically placed back the same day, at least with one or two lifts of asphalt. We don't allow more for, um, we don't allow more. I'm not sure if there's kind of a typo and I'm trying to figure out what she's saying here. We don't allow uh, for more than 0.15. Ah, 0.15 feet of deflection, gotcha, between lanes when removing asphalt. Therefore, typically what is removed is placed back on a daily basis. Otherwise, K-Rail or one one-way traffic control would have to remain in place. Therefore, it would make it hard to have erodible soils applicable to pavement operations of existing pavement. Also, Caltrans specs require paving with no rain and temperatures below 50. Okay, Christina, um, reach out to us if you have a, a specific question, but thank you for the examples of how Caltrans does it. Um, that's very helpful as you are probably doing the most. Um, paving in the state. Um, okay, what course of action can we as qualified SWIP practitioners take if a subcontractor refuses to make corrections, uh, damage BMPs in the required amount of time? Um, the course of action you can take as a QSP, Don, is, um, you know, I, I would start with 
um, you know, having discussions with whoever you're contracted by, um, you know, to let them know that you are trying to do your job um, as you were hired to do, uh, and they're not allowing for it. Um, and then if you need to escalate, you can always uh, contact your local regional water board um, if they need to maybe take a look at the discharger or legally responsible person um, and how they are complying with the permit requirements. Um, and then there's some good back and forth between uh, attendees and um, some of our regional board staff. Um, I'm gonna skip over that in the uh, interest of time. We only have five more minutes, um, but you all can read through that. Um, I see one that says contractor is utilizing private property for staging area exclusive to a project. Is that location subject to inspection? I would say yes, it should be considered part of the project area. Thank you. Yes. Rain event action plan is no longer required. That's correct. We removed the rain event action plan. If the pollutant source assessment determines background soil has high levels of metals or nitrogen, does that trigger non-visible pollutant slash TMDL samples during every rain event? Um, no, it does not. It's only if you have a breach malfunction spill, failure of a BMP or a failure to uh, implement any BMPs. Um, a clarification of a demolition question from before, if the structure is removed between January, February, then the foundation foundations and soil disturbing activities initiate in March, would the permit be required to be obtained in January or in March when the soil disturbing activities occur? This is not an acreage question. It's a timing question. I would say permit coverage would be recovered prior to the soil disturbing activities. So prior to March. Yes. Um, a clarification, someone said the 100 milligrams per liter of total suspended solids in the industrial permit is the annual average. The instantaneous max is 400 milligrams per liter. That's correct. Um, but the 100 milligrams per liter is the uh, level that we want folks to compare their samples to. Um, same question on the timing of demolition. Will inspection reports need to be uploaded to SMARTS? No, Jack, they will not. Um, we, we want to make sure that you are retaining those inspection reports, using them to take corrective actions, but they do not need to be uploaded into SMARTS. Can a construction site undergo construction activities while a notice of non-applicability application is in review? Great question, Luz. This is from one of our regional water board colleagues. Um, if they have permit coverage uh, to start construction and they apply for a notice of non-applicability in the meantime, Yes, they can undergo construction while they have coverage. If they plan to apply for a notice of non-applicability and do not have coverage, um, they should have that notice of non-applicability um, submitted uh, ahead of time. Uh, a great question here from Mark. Um, you didn't miss it. We, I'm not sure that we specified. He wants to know, does the 100 milligram per liter total suspended solid surrogate apply to applicable numeric action levels, as well as numeric effluent limitations for organochlorine compounds and metals? Just the numeric effluent limitations, Mark. Yep. The numeric action levels stay um, as listed. Um, 
Okay, one more minute. I'm, I'm trying to find good ones. I wanna make sure that we cover as much as we can. Um, can a physical rain gauge be replaced by electronic rain stations? I don't see why not. Yeah, and then also, is it acceptable to use a nearby government precipitous gauge, i.e. a CIMIS station? instead of setting up a personal weather station. Um, I think we determined, yes, you can use um, the government gauges, um, like the, the NOAA gauges that are um, throughout California. Um, okay, well, I think we got most of the, the questions answered in some part or another. Brandon, can you, yeah. So we have reminders here. Next week, we have a board workshop and that's in front of the State Water Board, April 19th, 2022. We are agenda item nine on that agenda. So it will be later in the day, but please do pay attention to uh, the progression of the meeting so that you can participate um, when needed. Uh, also, we are accepting public comment letters on the following four items until noon on May 2nd. So this is the anti-degradation findings, the regulatory transition period, the nitrogen-based nutrient waste load allocations translated into numeric action levels instead of effluent limitations, and the sediment-based numeric effluent limitations to implement certain metal organochlorine pesticide and PCB waste load allocations. Um, and then further, the board meeting is tentatively scheduled for July 19th, 2022, for the board to consider adoption of the reissue permit. Um, and Brandon, can you put our contact info up? Um, again, I wanna thank everyone for participating. Um, and I wanna thank all of these wonderful faces here on the screen for their help in the background and with developing this permit reissuance, as well as a uh, thank you to our Office of Chief Counsel and uh, Diana Messina, the NPDES permitting section manager. Um, thanks everyone. And please reach out to us if you have any questions, you can contact Brandon or I directly or send your um, questions or comments to stormwater at waterboards.ca.gov and we will respond to them the best we can. Again, any comments or questions sent now and in, regarding to this, in, in regards to this workshop, um, are not going to be written or oral comments to the board. Um, this is an informal public workshop. So without anything else, thank you all very much.